republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilor Donovan? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Baybine? Here. And um, are there any general public comments that um, anyone would like to st uh, get up and speak about? And this should be about an, an, any item or issue that is not on tonight's agenda. You have three minutes that you can state your name and address, please. Don't start the timer before I start speaking, please. Oh, for God's sake. It's extremely rude when you do that. <laughs> Is there anybody else that would like to speak while the gentleman gets prepared? The gentleman's prepared right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be reading from my book tonight, Chapter 2, Lines 12 through 22, covering a drug arrest that went... Uh, extremely sideways. A young female hotel clerk named Crystal Sandstrom placed a call to the, self, uh, to the Scarborough Police Department headquarters on Route 1. She thought a guest was a drug dealer. Very soon after that, Officer Josh Gray, who is no longer with the police department here, was on the scene at the hotel, where after many meetings with the young desk clerk and much surveillance of the subject, a romance blossomed between Ms. Sandstrom and the married Officer Gway. The desk clerk became pregnant, Officer Gway divorced his wife, and married the mother of his child. All while the sources tell us that the desk clerk slash cop girlfriend slash cop wife slash confidential informant to the Scarborough Police Department was helping the Scarborough Police to build a case against Bobby Collins, age 32. Later, the Scarborough Police Department made a traffic stop and developed the drug case against Collins. He was sentenced to time served, waiting for his trial date. According to the Scarborough Police Department's website, Collins was arrested for three Class A felonies, each carrying a 20-year sentence. How does a potential 60-year sentence get plea bargained down to five and a half months, waiting for the trial to come to the top of the docket? Easy. Scarborough Police had ruined the case with Officer Gray having a baby with the key witness, the confidential informant. Had Bobby Collins' defense lawyer, Robert LeBrassier, Esquire, been given these facts, it's likely the client would have avoided the entire arrest, indictment, and jail time. Perhaps Collins should consider <laughs> suing every member of the Scarborough Police Department that had any knowledge of this. And the discovery was withheld from the attorney all this time and likely the entire case would have died before it ever got to the indictment. Now, everybody in the command structure knew this was going on, including Chief Moulton. Moulton, to cover up this uh, misconduct, promoted uh, Gway to acting sergeant. And then a few weeks later, he was taken to a federal law enforcement awards luncheon, and here's the copy of the email that I got through a freedom of access request and was given a plaque for a job well done, ruining a triple class A felony arrest, getting the witness pregnant, divorcing his wife, and marrying the woman. A job well done and a plaque saying he did a good job. This is your command structure in Scarborough. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? Good evening, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Um, last week you passed on the second reading the temporary sign ordinance. I attended all four meetings of the council, the ordinance, and the planning committee. On the first two meetings I spoke and, and had some suggestions on, on changes in it. They were changed at the ordinance committee meeting and presented last week. Uh, specifically the 50 feet were going to 30 feet. Uh, the tenth of a mile was being changed to 30 feet. Um, <clears throat> during the meeting last week, the changes, the written procedures or ordinance was just passed out at the time of the vote. Uh, I didn't read it. I don't see as of 5 o'clock tonight that it's on the town website. What I did find or what someone sent to me was that this got attached to it. There's a drawing at the end, a schematic that didn't exist in any of the preceding meetings. And in it, we have the 
every major intersection basically on Route 1 and on Payne Road has a turning lane, a left, a right turning lane. And so the diagram says, oh, it's not 30 feet from the corner. You have to go all the way back to the, the beginning of the turn lane and then measure 30 feet. So effectively, the first sign, the sign on the corner, is going to be 150 feet or further back. That was not, as far as I know, discussed anywhere. I don't know that anyone on the council was aware of that. Um, that's, that's not good. It, uh, it really, uh, <coughs> really changes the whole intent of going from 50 feet to 30 feet to say every, every corner with uh, these intersections. And like I say, I'm not aware of any discussions at the Ordnance Committee or at any other place. The other part about the, the uh, sign on it, since you passed it last, at the last meeting, just driving around town, you can't go by a major intersection without seeing signs. Uh, I've yet to see one that has the appropriate wording on it. And most of them also don't fit the requirements as far as the distance is concerned. I think we're going to have a real problem trying to, to uh, bring compliance with this. I mean, we're going to have to send someone out, at least on a weekly basis, to identify every sign when it was put up and then try to c make contact with people that uh, don't have the proper information on it. We have a lot of businesses, national businesses, that have thousands of outlets. They're not going to make up a special sign for Scarborough when they have a sale on. So I think we really need to take another look at the, the whole sign ordinance because if it's not enforceable, what's the sense? And people do want to uh, comply. When I got up here and supported it, I was supporting it from the standpoint of political signs. And in that context, it looks fine until I got this diagram. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harwell. I'm Susan Hamill, um, Bay Street in Pine Point. And I'm up here tonight because I'd like to uh, try to clarify some comments that I have made to the council um, at some prior meetings. First, I want to thank all of you for your service to the town. You put in more hours and more energy into, into doing what you do than any of us could ever know. And I really appreciate it, and I thank you for it. We all have the same goal, to make Scarborough the very best that we can. We simply sometimes disagree on how we're going to get there. And that's just a fact of life. But I have said in the past when, I'm up here, when I've been up here that it feels like sometimes the council isn't listening. And what I really meant was that there are two members of this council, two, and I'm not going to name them, who are not listening. And I appreciate that the council has, other members do listen and have made extreme efforts to reach out to the public and, um, and get public input. These two individuals, I'm sure you know who you are. And basically um, have said that I was elected to do a job and that the public puts its trust in me and I will make up my own mind in my own way. And that public input is almost irrelevant. And I'm sorry about that. But I especially want to apologize to all the other counselors when I have been up here and I've said the council isn't listening because I know that's really not true. There are five people who are listening and I appreciate it. Thanks. Any other comments? Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Uh, will there be a um, public comment on the tax abatement? Yes. Thank you. Any other comments? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment section. Moving on to item number five is the minutes um, to accept the <coughs> September 6, 2017 regular meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Any, thank, you. thank you. Any edits, uh, modifications, or changes for the clerk? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Um, there are no um, <coughs> adjustments to tonight's agenda. I have already signed the treasurer's warrants. 
Um, order number 17-075 is a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed amendment to the second contract zoning agreement between the Town of Scarborough and Robert Jettis and Lucinda Malbon as presented by the Planning Board. Is there, um, I'd like to open it up to a public hearing. Is there any comments? Not seeing any. Um, I believe this will go to a second reading on October 4th. Moving on to order number 17-085 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 1301, the general assistance ordinance pursuant to title 22 MRSA 43054 regarding general assistance. Is there any public comment? I'll open up the public hearing. Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions for staff regarding this? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Moving on to order number 17-086 this is a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed amendments of chapter 405, the zoning ordinance section, I'm horrible with Roman numerals, is that six? Six, definitions in section um, 17, 18, sorry, B, Hagas Parkway District as presented by SEDCO. Um, is there any, sorry, I was debating whether to invite Ms. Martin up, if there needs to be, but we'll open it up to a public hearing first. Is there any public comments? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion? Actually, this is just a public hearing, correct? And this will also be on the October 4th agenda. Moving on to order number 17-087, it's a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough's official zoning map to rezone the parcel located in the Enterprise Business Park identified as map U39, lot 4701, as shown on the Town Assessor's Map from the General Business District B3 to the Higgins Parkway District HP. And I have a feeling I just butchered that name. Again, I can hear Judy Roy telling me how to pronounce it properly, but I uh, apologize for that. Um, is there any public comments regarding the change? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing, and this will also be on the October 4th agenda. Moving on to order number 17-088 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading to repeal chapter 308, Town of Scarborough's um, ordinance regulating political signs in the public right away. Is there any public comment for the public hearing? I've given some thought to this since the uh, meeting two weeks ago. Uh, there's a number of companies, like real estate companies, that have three and four signs on one street selling houses. Are they going to be required to have a tenth of a mile between house for sale signs on a street when the houses are a tenth of a mile apart? This law, or this proposed rule, whatever you want to call it, violates the content rulings on the Supreme Court in three huge decisions. The state of Maine might have a law saying you can do this, but I would remind you of a law uh, in uh, the South called Brown versus Board of Education. That was overturned by the Supreme Court also. I don't know why you guys are spending money to have Drummond and Woodson draw up something that you can't defend in court. You can't have content-based discrimination you have to have equal protection of the law, the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution. You can't say a political sign doesn't have the same protection as a real estate sign or a sign selling hamburgers. You can't single out one particular thing like political free speech and regulate it the way you want to regulate it. I don't know what you've spent for legal fees from Drummond and Woodson. I will be filing a freedom of access to find out what amount of money has been spent on this foolishness because it's not defendable. And I would recommend that you do away with this proposed ordinance immediately. Thank you. Anybody else that would like to speak? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a um, motion from the council? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments regarding the proposal. Though, would you like to give a recap on what this does so that people understand? Because the comments were a little confusing from the public. This is 17088? Yes. Uh, 
as a part of the sign ordinance, uh, we had to make the uh, uh, ordinances, all of the ordinances, content neutral as they dealt with signs. Uh, we have a sign ordinance. We revamped it in its entirety to make it content neutral. Uh, there was also uh, another ordinance, the political, uh, which section is that? The uh, uh, Chapter 308. Chapter 308, political signs, uh, which was not content neutral. Uh, it uh, is now uh, superseded by the ordinance that we passed. Uh, and so this ordinance needs to be repealed. Uh, pretty straightforward. It, uh, it's, uh, it would not withstand a constitutional challenge. Uh, we realize that all along, and this is just a tag-along part of wrapping up the uh, the sign work that we've been doing. Thank you. Councilor Rowan, did you have a comment? Oh, no, I think that covers it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from Council? Not seeing any. Moving the question, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to order number 17-093 is a public hearing and action on the request for a food handler's license from Susie Snowflakes Edibles, doing business as Beale's Famous Ice Cream, located at 29 Gorm Road. Also, Van Rio, doing business as Pizza Time Dimitris, located at 185 U.S. Route 1, and Carrie Munson, doing business as Pleasant Hill Cafe, located at 132 Pleasant Hill Road. Um, uh, is there any public comment? I'll open up the public hearing. <coughs> Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing, and is there a motion from Council? So moved. Second. Any questions for the clerk regarding the licenses? Councilor Yazo. Just, just one question. Um, it was brought to my attention, not necessarily anybody on this particular list, but if, if a business is not in good graces with their property taxes or they're later and they're on some kind of payment plan, that is grounds for refusal of a food handler's license, correct? That's correct. They okay. have to bring it up, bring the payment up current, yes. Okay. And that is reviewed even on not just for new applications but for renewals as well? That's correct. Even okay. on uh, liquor licenses, we also do that too. Okay. Thank you. So as a follow-up question, are the applicants that are asking for this food handler's license up to date with their taxes or in a payment arrangement that's accessible yes, to the town. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any, moving the question, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Moving on to order number 17-094, it's a 7 p.m. public hearing, an action on the renewal request for junkyard permits pursuant to Title 30A, MRSA, Chapter 183, Goldstein Steel Company, Inc., located at 36 Running Hill Road, A. Gagnon, or E. Perry, is that or, or should it be and? What you've got was A. Gagnon, or E. Perry Iron and Metal, located at Rigby Road, Skyro Auto Parts, located at 40 Holmes Road, and Speedway Auto, located at 343 Payne Road, as presented by the clerk. Opening up for public comments in the public hearing, is there anybody that would like to speak? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing, and is there a motion from Council? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments for staff? Not seeing any, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. On to old business, order number 17-015 is a second reading on the six month moratorium on retail marijuana establishments and retail marijuana social clubs. I'd actually like to ask the chair of the ordinance committee to give us an overview and then I'll open it up to public comments so that people uh, certainly. Uh, this has been before the council before. This is the second reading. Uh, we had a public hearing on the moratorium also. Uh, what we're essentially doing is establishing a six-month period where we will not be accepting uh, any applications for uh, retail establishments or social clubs. Uh, and that will give the state enough time to finish its work, and we will then follow directly up, uh, upon the state's completion of its work to adopt an ordinance that would uh, deal with uh, all aspects of the marijuana issue. Thank you. With that, is there any comments from the public? Not seeing any, is there a motion from council? To move. Second. Any comments or questions for council, or for staff even? Not seeing any, all those in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. 
Order number 17-080 is an act to create an ad hoc budget advisory committee that was tabled from the August 16, 2017 town council meeting. Um, with that, is there anybody that would like to speak on this item from the public? Not seeing any, um, we'll pl close the public comment. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. And comments and questions? Councilor Foley. Um, so this was obviously something that I had put out there and also uh, tabled uh, to such a time when we could uh, reconvene uh, or convene uh, a meeting with both the school board and the council. Um, and kind of at the direction and suggestion of the chair, I've been kind of, I have not personally reached out to try to see when or how that should happen um, and been kind of waiting to hear. So as far as, it's a, it's a concept I'm still very uh, much in support of and passionate about. I think, um, you know, three failed referendums, uh, no matter which side of the vote you were on, uh, says to me that we need to do something more to get more people involved in a variety, in new ways. Um, and so I'm wide open to, again, talking about, uh, you know, changing the composition or the, the structure of how we go about doing that, and I'd love to hear other ideas. So uh, I would, again, propose we table, I haven't heard from the chair, or maybe you have some comments about, or an update for us on <coughs> where, you, where those conversations have gone. Sure. So. Um, I'm going to give a very brief update on it as far as my role in this and maybe have Councillor uh, Hayes talk a little bit more as finance chair because it was brought up as part of a discussion with individual members of the finance committees, um, not necessarily the entire board. So um, if you're comfortable doing that, um, or I can talk about it too, but if you, I'd rather have you do it. Um, as chair, I did reach out to the chair of the school board um, as well as talked with the chair of their finance committee. Um, as you can imagine, especially with the uh, start of school, their schedule is extremely crowded, um, just as ours is too. So trying to find a time before today was um, very difficult and could not happen. Um, that's why at the last meeting I did kind of, I think I suggested that maybe the finance committees um, take this issue up as part of the joint. Um, and we've had some conversations. I, I know I have at least one-on-one -on -one with a couple of them. Um, but that's really all, I, that's all I've been able to get done in the two weeks or three weeks that it's been. So I apologize that there isn't more definitive. It's just getting everyone. They have as many committees as we do. <laughs> but uh, Councilor Hayes, did you want to add anything from the Finance Committee? Well, <coughs> not much more to add. I think <coughs> we did have a Finance Committee meeting, joint Finance Committee meeting this week, Monday night. <coughs> and at the end, I'll kind of summarize some of the things we did talk about. We talked about a, a variety of, of subjects about the budget process and where we are. Um, we really didn't come to a conclusion on this particular item, so I would suggest that we table this again until we're able to get to come together and have that discussion. I think it's a discussion for us whether, and I don't think we, we did float the concept, is this a full council board of education discussion or finance committee? And I don't think we really concluded one way or the other, so I think it's still an open item. So I would recommend that we table this to a, a future date. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions, Councillor Sinclair? Um, uh, Katie, I'd, I'd be happy as the Chair of Communications to um, sit down with you and maybe work through fine-tuning um, your proposal uh, and work out, maybe work out some of the kinks, maybe talk to some of the people um, from the round tables that we've talked to, um, get some feedback from them, and then come back to the council with a proposal. I'd be happy to join you and maybe help move the process along a little bit if that's the direction that you're willing to go in. Other comments or questions want to be shared? So um, just um, I'm glad that we're tabling it because it, 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 one, it's very important and we need to do it right because one of the one of the concepts that we were talking about at the Joint Finance Committee meeting is, um, you know, we have a process that isn't exactly perfect it's working, but it's not perfect, and we want to make that more perfect. Um, and so creating additional processes to accompany an imperfect process already adds complications and can add, I don't want to say conflict, it, it, can, it can be emotional in, in the process. So, um, you know, I think that it's nice, and the recommendation to push this further back is actually um, well thought out. I will say, personally, um, I actually am the only one um, 
probably the only one left in Scarborough because I don't remember who else was on the darn committee. We actually did this once before. And it was in 1999 when I first ran for the school board. And the school board itself had an ad hoc advisory committee meeting. And there were, I, mean, I want to say there must have been 25 people that were selected from the community that was part of that. And it turned into a political, more of a political show than it was a fiasco, more than it was a, pro, um, a process in which we accomplished something. Um, and that's because of the way that it was formed, why it was formed. Um, it was a very different environment in the sense that um, um, people that had been elected had been very out to the school board was a very outspoken former editor of a local paper and all kinds of conflict that came out of it. And so I want to do it right and I don't believe that this type of structure is the right approach. So I hope that when you do take into consideration what we want to move forward, I would rather see this be a task force that reports directly into both managers so that they can, because they're the ones that have to implement the recommendations. If this truly is about efficiencies and effectiveness and about programs and things in that nature, then um, I want them to be the, the managers or the controllers of this process so that it's uh, useful for them and that they can implement that. So if you could take that into consideration as you're crafting it, um, I just I think it needs to be out of the political realm and that it reports directly into the staff that's going to implement it um, so that they can control it. So if you would take that into consideration, if this does move forward, then I would appreciate it. But it sounds like it might be tabled this evening, and we'll bring it up later. Any other comments? Yeah, I, I, I like the idea that uh, the Finance Committee uh, will take this up. I think the Joint Finance Committee meetings really ought to be a collaborative, collaborative effort that would allow a determination as to where, if any, flaws there are in the process and what the best way to respond to it. This is one idea, uh, but uh, I'd first like to understand where the six people on the joint finance committees of the town and the school believe there are deficiencies and then express what those are uh, and, and what are the best ways to solve them. Uh, right now, I think the process is incredibly transparent and open, uh, and we have sessions repeatedly to give people the opportunity uh, and the materials that are, are uh, prepared uh, for the budget are so extensive, it's, re it's remarkable. And so I'm kind of looking and saying, what's the problem? Is it that a special interest group feels they'd like to have more involvement? Well, okay, but I'm not sure that's, that would not be the basis for getting me to vote for this proposal. Council <coughs> Foley. Um, so I just want to reiterate, and I don't want to belabor it this evening because we're not having the full discussion, but really the intent behind it is not about, for me anyway, uh, is not as much about looking back at this year and the process and nitpicking and saying we did this wrong, we did that wrong. It's really about bringing a wider group of people together who we could create what I would call uh, local champions so that, uh, you know, and again, whatever that composition is, um, it's different. But then the more information they have, the more information they get uh, comfortable with and, and the facts that we pr help provide to them, um, then the story that we want supported in the public eye has a better chance uh, of going through. I think the ultimate goal is really getting back to a place where we can pass the budget the first time around uh, because people believe in it. And I don't think that's you know, where we were this year. So that's really my intent. It's not about nitpicking uh, pieces apart and saying we did anything wrong. I'm not, I don't believe that. It's about moving forward. So, um, but I am, and I do like uh, Councillor St. Clair's suggestion, and then maybe that's something we even do in conjunction <coughs> with. Uh, if the Joint Finance Committee wants to put this on their agenda and have that discussion, of course they can do that. If the Communications Committee wants to host a roundtable specific to this topic and talk to you know, get public input on what would a committee of like this look like, um, then that would be an opportunity for them. And then we could take, you know, the discussion from both of those uh, places and meld, you know, what we think is kind of the best suggestion. So I'm wide open to all of that. Um, and I love more conversation. So, um, but I am happy to table it for this evening. Councilor Chiazzo. 
Yeah, I'm not going to belabor the point because it's not really debating. I'm glad we're going to table it. I was pretty clear with what my concerns were with the initial proposal. Nothing's really changed since then, and the wording's changed since then. Um, my, one of my biggest hiccups is how is the composition of the committee. I thought it was fairly clear that there really isn't a precedent for something like that. It doesn't mean that we can't. I just want to see a clear criteria and understanding of how someone or a group or an individual is going to be chosen to be put on that board, and I'd like it to be open to pretty much anybody, because if we start excluding and including, I think that just divides different camps and different groups. So um, my suggestion, I, I, I appreciate Councilor St. Clair's offer to, to support you and, and get that wording in line, and I certainly would be available to um, address any concerns I might have. Uh, and I will wait and see what you guys come up with with a proposal before I move, move forward, but I'm glad we're going to table it. Um, certainly the composition was a very important aspect from my perspective. Council Hayes? Yeah, and I think I just wanted to kind of address Council Donovan's comments. Um, we had a pretty full discussion on our joint. We hadn't met in a while, so we had kind of a far-ranging conversation on a variety of things. We really talked about <clears throat> the budget process, what may have worked, what didn't work, things we could do. We had a pretty lengthy conversation about forecasting and does that make sense or not make sense. We really didn't get into this particular topic. We did float it and we said there's, you know, what would, what would we want to do? Is this a finance committee, joint finance committee <clears throat> function or a full board? And I don't think we really got a clear answer to that. So <coughs> it needs to be a work in progress. I think, it, as Sean would suggest, I think we need to check back with the Board of Education and figure out how they'd like to approach it, too. But that's, we, we did continue, I, and I was jumping ahead, I was going to report out. But a, but a positive sign is we did talk about a lot of things, but we decided as a group that we're going to continue to meet year-round. So we're going to continue the process and really actually start some of the budget work now. I mean, some of the conversations we're already going to start is, okay, what does next year look like? What are some of the drivers? What are some of the things? So let us kind of go through that process, and then we will report back about a, a process to move forward on, on, <coughs> on this proposal. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Anybody? Councilor St. Clair? Yeah, I just want to, the, the one thing that um, trips me up a little bit with it um, going in the direction of the finance committee into in, in that direction is that um, if it goes towards the communications <coughs> committee and we can do a polling or a round table then we're sort of a then we're answering that need from the community of we need more input we want more input we want to give more input so I feel like that way we can address that piece of it Whereas I feel as though I get a little concerned if it sits with the finance committee, they've got so much on their plate that they don't have as much time to sort of sit around a round table with, with um, community members. That's my only, um, my only issue with it. The, the, the good part about it and the, my hope would be that someone from that committee would be involved with the, maybe the forming or the wording of this is that they do have the experience and the knowledge um, that we don't have from our group. Does that make sense? Um, so I would definitely want to see some input from them. Um, we got a, we, we, one of the biggest concerns that we got, I think, from our sessions that we've had um, is that people are really asking us to have more conversations at this level with the with us, the seven of us. They want to hear us discussing these things more openly. Um, so that's why I'm glad that we're having this discussion tonight and we're sort of fielding this between all of us because um, even though we may know in our minds, oh, I know, I know that you know, Councillor Donovan feels this way, so that's good, I know we're good, you know. Well, the public doesn't know that. I'm just using that as an example. Um, but, and so one of their concerns was they want to hear that, you know, they want to hear us talk more. Whereas I've always sort of been of the mind frame of like, I talk too much, and <laughs> people probably are like, stop, somebody stop her. Um, we really got the opposite feedback, and you know, these guys, these guys were all there, so please, you know, jump, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
we really got the opposite of that where people really want to know where we stand and they want to know why we stand where we stand. Um, so going back to, to the um, original proposal that's on the table, um, I agree with the concept of it mostly because I've seen how much good I think the roundtables have created and I know how much feedback, positive feedback we've gotten from them. Um, so for me, this looks, feels like a, a branch of that um, and I feel like any time that we can include the public in a positive setting that moves forward and doesn't look back like you said, um, because what we don't want to cr ever create is a, an environment where we're sitting around a table and we're bashing things that that went wrong. That's uh, completely unproductive, <coughs> and that's one thing we've never had, which has been a, we've been I think we've been really lucky. Um, so my my point is, um, I kind of wanted to address a little bit of why I felt like it might not be the finance committee might not be the best place for this to go to. Um, I'd like to see it. In front of the either in front of the communications committee, um, or have a couple of us form something where we sit down and hash some of these things out, and then we bring a proposal back to the council as a whole. That's just my opinion. Councilor So I, I and I, I understand where you're coming from, and I think I don't think it has to be an either-or situation. I think we could do parallel things. I think you certainly, as communications, we rely on that group to poll the community and, and not just ex communicate individual ideas, but to communicate the, the, the images and the, and, the, and the issues that are coming out from the council as a whole. So I think we could do both. Uh, my challenge with putting it in, in one committee or the other is uh, the budget's probably one of the most comp complex and, and drawn out processes that we do as a council. We rely on a lot of expertise and I, I do think that well, I, I don't think necessarily the finance committee should be responsible for organizing this council and, or this committee and structuring it. Um, you do have the benefit of having the chair of the finance on communications, so that's 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 a positive thing. I see us kind of as doing parallel work and then coming together collectively as a body and deciding what we want the makeup to be, how we want, what outcomes do we expect, and then you know that will kind of I think drive the type of of um, people that we want and what, whether we want experts, do we want citizen involvement, we want a combination of all those things. I mean, I think it's like any other committee. I think we can work collectively in our individual groups to establish what that need's going to be, uh, and then we come together collectively to determine what that is at the council. Then we can construct a committee that, that meets those needs, I think. So I think it can be done parallel. Um, from a procedural standpoint, uh, I think if we table this, we have to put a date that we're going to take it back up again. I might suggest <coughs> that the motion be withdrawn so that we can do some preliminary work first and we're not trying to get to a date because we've got a lot of other things coming to. I'm not saying that we put it away for good, but I think what's going to come out of the communications and this, this discussion is going to be somewhat different than what's in front of us. So I just might suggest from a procedural standpoint we withdraw this motion. It can come back at a later date, but I think if we table, we have to put a date to it. Yeah, we do. So just a thought. That's a <coughs> um, so I thank everyone for the discussion. It's, uh, this is, I think, really good and healthy, as Kate kind of was saying. And it is exactly the kind of discussion that we've been hearing people want more of. Um, I want to keep it kind of live if we can, and I'm happy even if we went out three meetings. But I, my fear is if we take it off, then it's really easy to let it go away. Um, so we can look at the calendar and, and give ourselves some time. The other thing that I think is really key and what was remiss in my first uh, uh, pass and throwing it out there relatively quickly was you know, not engaging with uh, some of the Board of Education members directly. So I also want to, whether we're having one-on-one -on -one conversations over coffee about their thoughts and feelings, uh, whether it's a you know conversation with the superintendent, those I think those things that input for me. So my preference was uh, was to have that's why I wanted to have a full uh, combined workshop. Um, understanding the logistics of trying to plan that is a bit of a, been a bit of a nightmare. And yeah, I think someone's been at a meeting every single night for the past like 120 days. So um, I, I get that, and I'm happy to give us the give us the time that it needs. Um, so that's where that's where I kind of am. So, 
think Councilor Rowan. I, I did. Council just, Beck. just, just listening to the conversation, I, I, um, I really appreciated the the desire to get everybody involved with the with the joint workshop because I think um, there those of us that are not neither mm -hmm. the finance nor the communications also have strong feelings about how we could move the process forward. Um, so I'd love to be included in those conversations. I'm happy to to do it with. If we can do that without creating the legal meeting. Alyssa Sinclair. The only the only thing I and Katie just briefly touch on it, but the one thing after um, Councillor Chiazzo's comments, the one thing I wanted, I would n not, I would like to see happen at least tonight is to make sure that um, we're designating at least someone, um, whether that's the chair um, or it's Katie or whoever it is, but I, I would like to see someone designated um, to be the person who will be in touch with the school board. Um, to whatever extent that is, that can be decided at a later time. But I think it's important that we make sure that um, if we're not going to be able to get a joint workshop with them, which is completely understandable, um, I don't want to see that that opportunity missed. And I want to make sure, I, I mean, they also have a communications group that um, is very active. And, um, you know, maybe that's us meeting with just their communications group. Um, but I would like to make sure that um, they are um, kept up to date as, as the process goes. Because I'd hate to see us going down a road and we start working really heavily on something and they go, whoa, wait a minute, we can't do that. And we didn't realize that we couldn't do that. So I'd like to see just, I know that, um, I know that the Chairman Baybine is the liaison to them and I know that I'm his backup, but um, just kind of maybe see how everyone else feels on how maybe that, what direction we should go in that regards to that. I think Councilor Hayes was next. Yeah, and I guess I'm just kind of responding to Councilor Hayes. What I'd like to be able to do, and I think kind of picking up on Councilor Foley, I, I would like to at least put this back on our agenda sometime before the elections because as I look at this, there, there could be quite a bit of turnover and sort of the people that have been involved in the process this year. So it would really be good to get everybody that was involved in the process this year at the table to have a conversation. So I would suggest trying to bring this back sometime, you know, in our second meeting in October or something, just so we can touch base. And hopefully, and I, and I find that if you have a date certain on something, it does kind of mm. put pressure on to at least have conversations and do some things. So, it, it, uh, to respond to Councillor St. Clair's comments, one of the things that we brought up a, a, a several meetings ago now, I think, was the fact that um, at the joint finance committee meetings, is it doesn't it doesn't necessarily need to be joint finance. We are doing similar things with communication. So, maybe this is the opportunity for the communications group to establish those interactions and relationships with the school's communication committee, because it is a different makeup than is on finance as well. So, I would certainly encourage that to happen, even if not just centered around this issue. Um, any excuse to, I think, kind of get together and, and talk about issues certainly helps. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's, that's an approach that could be, could be worked out and probably might be a good catalyst to start that in motion. I think the, the thought with joint finance is we have been doing it for a while and we, we have some, I don't want to say the relationships are already established, but we, we've got a pretty functioning high functioning working group together and, and we could have those conversations, I think, not saying that you couldn't. Um, so I would actually support you, you know, reaching out and having a joint communications committee meeting and I'm sure that they would, I, well, I can't speak obviously for the, for, the, for the school board, but I think that would be something they seem to be receptive to as well. Council Rowan? I think the other thing I really liked about having the, a, a joint discussion about it was just so they could be out in public rather than, mm -hmm. you know, because there's, there, we want to make sure that we're bringing the public along. Mm -hmm whatever's being discussed. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I think that a, a joint communication meeting would certainly achieve that. And I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, um, Sean. Um, well, we could also, um, for our next communication meeting, because we haven't scheduled it yet, we could actually talk to um, the school board's communications group and possibly invite them to be a guest at our meeting, and that would allow any council members to also Chris has actually joined our communication meeting before, and we've like, I'm not sure if he spoke, but we made eye contact a couple times, like, do you think this is okay? Oh. You know, so. Um, it's good oh, to yeah. not to, that's a challenge, right? <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> so, because the forum is, is a, a little bit different than, you know, the finance forum and things like that, um, it might be a more open setting for us to have sort of more of a dialogue and um, when we set that date, I'll just make sure we send it to all of the council members 
um, but I will check with um, their, their communications group, as long as this is an okay plan for everyone here. Um, Katie, especially since this is your, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, not taking this over at all. Obviously, you're on communication, so. Um, but I think it would give them a great opportunity to join us in that meeting, and maybe we could hash out a couple things and see what level of their involvement is. Plus, it will also give them a couple weeks for them to check in with their group to get maybe their consent, their group consensus. So I'll make sure that um, we, that Katie and I work on that, and as long as that's the direction that you all see, if you all think that's the best way to go. Okay. So I would, oh, sorry. Yeah, I would support this concept of a joint communications uh, uh, setting where the school board and the town communications committee takes the initiative to try to discuss between themselves wh where, where are the shortcomings, what are we trying to achieve with this, uh, what are the options for moving forward. Uh, I'm sure you'll probably find other members of the town council and the school board would attend those sessions. Yeah, which would be great. Um, just to add um, a couple of comments. One is, um, I appreciate I mean, this is a really great conversation. The one thing to consider, and I, I'm of a little bit different opinion than Councilor Hayes, I would actually recommend picking a date after the election because there could be three new councilors sitting here. Um, as well as two new school, there's definitely going to be two new school, bo school board members. One of them is on finance. So, you know, um, when, if it was an off year in which we're only electing two, then I could understand maybe doing it before because there's some continuity with fewer people leaving. But when you have three, yeah. Yeah. it could change the entire dynamic. Yeah. So, I mean, I, if you propose a date before the election, I'm, you know, I'll support it. I'm just saying is that I think it's more logical to do one after um, and, you know, when the new council is sworn in. Who knows, it may not change at all on our side. <laughs> yeah, just to follow up on that too, it doesn't mean, I don't think it, it doesn't mean that we can't continue to do the work and continue to have the meeting. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, it's more of a question of when do we bring it back and right. deliberate it as a whole. Um, I think, you know, we, we've agreed as a joint finance to continue working through the process because the business of the town has to go on. So yeah. um, I, I think, um, I mean, I could support either way. Yeah, so, right. um, yeah. but, I, but I do think that this shouldn't, that shouldn't prevent us from reaching out and starting the process of having the discussion. Yeah, I would be in favor of uh, when the communications committee says it's ready to come back is when it should come back. Thanks for that. I'm fine with that. Council Foley? Um, yeah, I'm very good with most of this discussion. Uh, I want to be careful not to do the same, make the same mistake twice, though, in that we haven't talked with anybody on their communications committee yet. <laughs> so kind of like when I, you know, came in here uh, and put what I thought was a great thing out here uh, and quickly realized that oh yeah, I really didn't talk to some of those people yet. So we haven't spoken to them yet. So I'm not, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, they're in support of that as well. The other thing, I guess I would counter argue the point around waiting till after the election, only that even if there are three new counselors here, the, the, the whole thing isn't going to get completed soup to nuts until after the election. Um, but if we start the conversation, even if the three of you weren't here, I'd still want your input whether it were as a sitting councilor or, you know, as a citizen, and I'm so sure you could provide that either way, but I don't see that as a reason to, to hold off on trying to get these conversations going. Because, I, you know, what happens is we have the election, and then we have the holidays, right. and then it's the middle of January, and we have five okay. nor'easters in a row, and then it's March, and then it's April, and it's budget season. Budget three weeks ago. And so for me, it's about trying to stay ahead of that. I, I do, before the tabling motion, I do want to uh, make it clear is that the school board, and particularly its leadership, even though I haven't talked to every individual on there, um, has communicated with us, uh, has responded. So it's not that they're not communicating at all. They are aware of this. And, you know, to be blunt or clear, I believe their preference is to move this beyond the election so that they have a full board that can participate in that <coughs> rather than, you know, one, at least one person that's leaving who is the current chair. Uh, so. Um, and the issue is that they don't have the time. So I don't want anyone to think that they have not been responsive because they actually have been very responsive to this issue. So um, with that, I would accept the table of motion. And if you could also include, if you so choose, you don't have to, but if you can include a date certain to when this should come back. So I'll make a table of the motion and I will uh, November, November 1st or November 15th, either one. 
that. I mean, I don't know what people think. The 15th gives us a little bit more time. 15th is after the election. It's after the election. But, right. It'll be same board. But, we're, but no, but the new sitting, they, they wouldn't be sworn in until the December meeting, correct? Correct. Yeah, they could participate. You know who they are. They could participate. You know who they are. They could we participate. That, that might not be a bad thing, though. Actually, that might be the perfect way to do it because then when everybody's here. Right. So why don't we say the 15th? True. So the motion is to table order number 17-080 to November 15th. Is there a second? Second. There is no debate. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to order number 17-095. It's a first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 901, the Town of Scarborough's Garbage and Recycling Collection and Disposal Ordinance. Article 1, Sections 1.09 and 1.10, <coughs> as proposed by the Ordinance Committee. Before public comment, um, could I have an overview from the Ordinance Chairman? Certainly. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward uh, issue. Uh, uh, this is an effort to keep trash cans from really becoming uh, illegal temporary signs, uh, larger than allowed. They're obviously four-sided, and uh, they are uh, uh, being put at the curb in the right-of-way. Uh, the carts are owned by the town. Uh, the uh, trash cans go with the property, and defacing the carts uh, can become a problem for the next owner. Uh, we are including a provision that will uh, allow people to put the address on the cart so that it can be easily identified as their cart, uh, uh, and uh, that's probably it. Thank you. Is there any public comment? <clears throat> Susan Hamill, uh, 3 Bay Street. I have a lot of concerns about this. Um, I know that the, be the bins are owned by the town and they're expected to last for several decades, but placing stickers on them um, really doesn't harm them and it might even prolong the life of the bin. Um, I live in a very congested area. In the summertime on Bay Street, there are, uh, there could, all the bins are on one side of the street. There could be 12 bins all in a row. And it could be renters. Someone puts it out and tells their kid to go get it in the morning after it's been collected. The kid doesn't know which bin. And um, so if you, if you, put some distinctive markings on them, like bumper stickers and crazy stickers, then it's pretty easy and very quickly you can identify which bin is yours. Um, a small tag with just, or, or you write 3 Bay Street, easily overlooked. And <coughs> I mean, I just hate it when someone takes my bin because I get their bin and uh, we keep ours pretty clean. We know what to do with lobster. And most people don't. <laughs> and I, then I have a lot of questions about how will the enforcement work. So will the trash company notify all homeowners who have placed stickers? Will there be a fine? Will public works come around and inspect? What has public works said about this? Um, are they they're okay? Are they okay with it? Um, so for a homeowner who's already got a lot of stickers on their bin, what are you, what are you going to do there? Are they, are they going to be required to replace their bin, even though it's worked perfectly fine? Um, will the town only act on complaints? So if somebody had a Trump bumper sticker and uh, the town gets a complaint uh, and then acts in force, couldn't we be, wouldn't that be unfair discrimination um, if we were really only looking at those kinds of things? If someone else had a, you know, saddleback sticker on and no one complains about that, that just wouldn't, wouldn't seem fair. And I, but I do think that you've got a, a, a big issue with, there are already hundreds of bins out there that have stickers on them and I don't know how you're going to deal with that. But I am sorry to see the council taking this up and spending time on this. I've heard that uh, this change uh, is being made in response to a single complaint about a political bumper sticker on someone's bin. 
I hate to see any enforcement time um, spent on this. It's money being spent on enforcement. And I really hate to think that the council is taking up a lot of time on this as well. Any other public comment? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. Is there a motion from council? To move. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or questions? Council Chiazzo. So if I could, the uh, town manager through the chair, what is the cost of the bins per bin? I beg your pardon, I don't, I don't uh, know. How much do the bins cost per unit? I understand the question. Oh, I don't sorry. know the answer to oh, that Oh, sorry, question. okay. Is that something that we could get Certainly. from, yeah, from I, Public Works? I just don't have that readily available. Okay. I, I can have it to you right away in the morning. Okay. That, to me, that would be important mm -hmm. because I think one of the, one of the possible outcomes maybe would be that um, the fine is the cost of the bin uh, because I, so I have a couple issues with this, right? I mean, it's, it's public property. That's, that's the number one thing, okay? We don't put political bumper stickers on our police cars, our fire trucks, or our school buses. It's public property. It's paid for by the taxes. It's paid for by the public. It's public property. Um, that, to me, supersedes anybody's individual right to put on what they feel like because it's in front of their house. Um, so I, I have a challenge with that argument against it. Um, as an enforcement issue, uh, perhaps we give them the option to purchase. That way, the next, if they eventually do sell their home or the next person inherits it, then they can start with a clean barrel and they can move on. And if people want to dedicate it, de decorate it, then so be it. Uh, I don't know how we would enforce that. I don't know how we would record it. Um, but that may be an option to look at as well for second reading or possible amendment. Um, but I, I think um, that I can see that as being a reasonable response to someone who wants to decorate their own trash can, but short of that, I would have a real problem allowing anybody to, I don't want to say desecrate, that's probably a bad word, decorate town property to their own personal likings, because I may not like little flower bumper stickers or unicorns and rainbows. I may not want to look at that every day across the street from mine, so that's my thought. Council Rowling? Yeah, I think I appreciate Ms. Hamill's comments and, and Council for Gaza. Um, I think I look at it more as the fairness to the future owner who's going to inherit that that bin. Um, I think that that being able to mark it with the address is sufficient to be able to tell them apart. And if there's a, it'll at least straighten straighten out the bins. But that's where I stand. Council Foley. Um, so I have kind of a different view, I guess. Um, and part of it is, so I live on a, a road that is. Uh, I mean, we all know when it's Sunday because you can hear the rumbling down the gravel road of, and my dog goes crazy because she hears it's very loud when they walk the bins down. And we only have three houses that service my road, so there's really only six bins there. But I can tell you every single week, it's like, oh, crap, did I, was I the first two? Was I the middle two? Was I the last two? I don't know sometimes because sometimes I put mine out and my neighbors before me, sometimes they're after. The funny part about this conversation for me is that my neighbors are Max and Apple people, and I'm a PC. So that has become kind of our uh, little standing joke on the road. They have little, you know, they're advertising mm. for Apple, you know, little Apple stickers. Nothing big, nothing, anyone driving by wouldn't even be able to see that they have that on there. Mm. But since they put their Apple sticker on there, you know, we've never been mixed up since then. Um, I struggle with trying to rationalize in my head that we have a big issue to solve with this and that it's a big problem. Uh, I just haven't seen or heard from any, I haven't seen a single complaint, so if we got one complaint, I, I don't know, I haven't seen it. Um, and I, I just feel like we're trying to solve a problem that isn't there. And the enforcement piece is, you know, um, we did have one barrel I know that was uh, hit by a, a snow plow and the, it was unrepairable so that you know it had to be replaced or whatnot. Um, those are things are going to happen from time to time, but I guess the cost of would be interesting. But I, I just I can't support this for, as it is. I just feel like we're going way too far. Um, that's all. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I think I, I I'm having a hard time with this also um, for similar reasons. One, it's been here three years. I've never had a single complaint about it. Um, how long how, how long have we had the barrel? Uh, most of the ones still deployed are the originals, so yeah. it's, it's over 10 years at this okay. point. So I've, had, I've had our barrels 10 years, and, and I do. I have a Saddleback sticker on each one because the same thing. We live in a development where at the end of the road, all lined up are 12 different barrels. 
Um, and so it's really easy to come in and see it. And I would, I haven't had a single complaint. I actually haven't seen very many barrels that are, you know, with a lot of stickers on them. I would suggest that, you know, the only thing I, I could support is that at the point in time someone turns the barrels back in, they're held accountable for making sure all the stickers are removed. Um, <coughs> but I, I just, from an enforcement point of view, and be able to enforce it fairly and equitably across all of Scarborough, I just see it's, it's just see little value into spending those types of resources to worry about stickers on trash cans. I, I do agree if we have to turn it back to the town, the individual should be responsible for getting them clean, however they do that. But I think putting fines on it and all of this type of stuff is just a, a little a little over the top. So I, I can't support it as drafted. And then the, the, the second question I have to go forward, what are you going to do about all of the folks that have already have decorated their barrels? Are their fines going to apply to them when they decorated them? There wasn't this ordinance in place, and it feels a little unfair to go back and penalize them sort of retrospectively for something that wasn't in place. So I'd like to see how we address barrels that are already decorated. What do we do? Uh, Rowan. I just wanted to read what, what it is that we're, the, the change that we're making. So the, the new language that we're inserting is that residents may choose to mark their cart with the street address that the cart was assigned to for identification purposes. Under no circumstances should the carts be defaced by the use of markers, stickers, or paint. A cart that has been defaced will be replaced at cost to the resident to whom the cart was assigned and may be subject to further penalties under section under Article 4. Um, so I think what we're talking about is really just we're charging the homeowner to replace it. And it's not a matter of you don't turn the cart back into the town when you when you move, you just leave it there. Right. And then it's just kind of well, the same how, in the, in the cleaning it before they, if they leave it for the next resident. Well, I, I think that that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for reading that, actually. You clarified. Council Kelly. So um, I can understand amnesty for, for immigrants and aliens. I have a hard time with amnesty for barrels. Um, I think it's public property. That's the bottom line to me, okay? Um, whether people are using, I understand the intent, it's to differentiate, okay? You go to an airport, people don't put giant, uh, most people, you, put a, you can put a ribbon, you can put a, a tag or something on a barrel that identifies it as yours. You can do something unique to that without defacing public property. So um, I, I agree it's also not necessarily something I would want to spend a lot of time with, but to me it's black and white. Uh, it's public property, we've all paid for it, they're tax dollars that were put towards this in the first place. So what gives an individual the, the ability to supersede that? We don't put bumper stickers on public vehicles. It doesn't mean that people don't have opinions. It just means that it's public property. It's, to me, it's pretty straightforward. Council St. Clair? It's a trash. I do have to. I know. <laughs> I, I had like a, I think I had a brain cramp. Um, <laughs> Got you on that. <laughs> Private joke. Um, uh, it's a trash can. It's a trash can. Um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. If there is a trash can right now that has been defaced with stickers or whatever, people are going to be charged now to replace them according to the way the ordinance is written. It, yes, Councilor Rowan? I believe so. I can't, I, yeah, I can't, I, I can't support that. Council Chiazzo. So I believe you have the ability to rectify the situation before you're charged. Yes, sir, you do. And I, you know, depending on who puts the stickers on it would depend on how the stickers come off. Okay. Olive oil works great, I know that, but that's just an Italian solution. Any other comments, Council Foley? Well, I, I use that. It really it's funny good. because the first Where thing I thought of when I thought of this was I grew up, went to Catholic schools from kindergarten through 12th grade, and, you know, you were assigned a locker, and that locker belonged to the school. And I can remember Sister Joan, you know, with her ruler, and yes, she did carry a ruler around <laughs> the school, and talking about how you were not to decorate the outside of your locker. Now, you could open up the inside of your locker, and you could put your, you know, posters of David Cassidy or whatnot. <laughs> Um, the school also, <laughs> okay, did you, I, whatever, I'm aging myself. Uh, the school also issued us, um, you know, textbooks. We were offered the opportunity to, to have some personal identity in a place where everything was uniform. And, and when I think about this, it, like, I just, I'd love to know what the, I, I've just not seen trash barrels that have been horribly defaced 
uh, to such a degree, or even decorated to such a degree that I'm thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> what were they thinking when they're doing that? Maybe they're out there. Um, I don't know. But, you know, there are plenty of other things, like the address for your house is a safety piece, right? You're supposed to have the address and, and there's pieces on the curb. But on our homes, we can choose to have a really ornate uh, display of our number, or maybe we want to make our number and duct tape on our front door. As long as the police and fire can see it and they can identify our house, there's something a little bit unique. And I just, I, again, I, I, I just see it as uh, chasing our tail uh, for something that just doesn't seem to be uh, worth, worthwhile. Um, again, unless I'm missing, I'd love to see some pictures of something that is offensive. I just haven't seen it, and maybe it's out there, but... Anyway. So before you, I'm going to talk, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, so I think this is, um, so by the way, go online, and even, I personally, I've never seen it here in Scarborough, but decorating recycling cans like this, or cans, is a big thing, and some, most of it is not really. Do you really, well, I don't know what they do, but no, there's some that, um, it's a whole artistic expression issue in which people do paint those. Um, in many communities. Um, sometimes it's encouraged, sometimes it's not. The issue is, um, we, uh, this is an example of us living in a too sensitive of a society and we have to react to it. Um, and that's because, you know, one person's art is another person's immorality uh, to some extent. So, you know, it's how do we control, and how do we manage to that content? And so, um, I personally resolve to, it's public property. Uh, we have a right to um, set some expectations around that. But I want to wait and listen to the public hearing, so I'll at least approve it tonight so I can get to the public hearing. Councilor Kazza. So I, I, I very much appreciate Councilor Foley's analogy of putting duct tape on her house. Um, the difference, though, is that the house is your property, um, and you could put a sign up in your yard as well. But to me, the differentiating factor is this is town property. So, And I do think, unfortunately, um, it has to be, it, because if we let a little bit be okay and not a lot, it really does have to be definitive and, and it has to be easily as easily enforceable as possible, which is why I think it has to be all or nothing in this instance. That's the only way to kind of keep it fair and instead of regulating it to a small sticker in the corner, I, I think it needs to be, it needs to be pretty clear. Councilor Rowan. I would also turn the analogy. If you're renting your house and you put duct tape all over it, you'd be responsible for the, for the damage when you move down. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With that, oh, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, uh, again, I, I'm, probably, I'm probably not going to support this because I think, but, but if it does go to the, the react, really would like us to think through the amnesty piece. I mean, I've got, in my neighborhood, I've got, I use stickers. The stickers will come up. All my other neighbors have painted number four on it or number three on it, whatever their house is. And I tell you, if all of a sudden we go to our constituents and we change the rule, and I bet those cans are probably 50 bucks a piece. Just think through, if we're going to go back and retroactively, someone's going to go around and look at every single trash can in town and assess retroactive penalties, I think that would be a PR nightmare. So I just think we need to think through what we want to do and the steps to put in place. I, I can, going forward is different than penalizing someone that did it five years ago and now assessing them a $100 penalty. For, so it could be $200 per household. Or someone who inherited that trash can that already had stickers on it. No, no. I, 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 think, I think it's a PR nightmare. Uh, but for what it's worth. Donovan, sorry. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the ordinance committee will uh, have the opportunity to talk about this, uh, which I think will be helpful in advance of the public hearing and the second reading. So, uh, but we'll take, we've heard all the comments and we'll, and we'll kind of uh, bore down a little bit. Uh, I did think that Councilor Hayes' identification of some barrels as having the number on the street, that's allowed. But it was painted on. But it's allowed. As long as it's the address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's painted on or stenciled on or or stickered on. If you're just putting the address on, on the barrel for the purpose of identification, it's allowed. Thank you. Not seeing any other questions, so I'm going to ask to move the question. All those in favor of the first reading and sending it to a public hearing, please vote. One, two, three, four. Those opposed? One, two, three. Thank you. It does pass. 
Order number 17-096 is an act on the request for an order directing the town manager to process payments for the tax abatements for the 2012 to 2015 consolidated tax appeals in accordance with the Board of Assessment Review's decision of May 10th, 2017, and further authorizing the use of funds from the end designated fund balance to satisfy these obligations. Before public comment, I'd like to have the manager provide an overview. This, uh, this is a matter that's been the subject of uh, some discussion through the years with council. Most of that discussion has occurred in executive mm -hmm. session uh, as, and we still are in current litigation regarding the matter. Uh, essentially, where the, these tax appeals sit at this point is the Board of Assessment Review on remand um, did make a final decision, and that is that decision that's being now appealed. And uh, this order uh, comes forward, and I, I suggest it to the Council, really in an effort to stop interest accruing, continuing to accrue to these accounts. Uh, just to put a finer point to that, uh, uh, we have interest expense in the order of $75 a day uh, or about $2,200 a month that are accruing. So this action would have us pay out these abatements uh, as directed by your uh, appointed local board assessment review. And we'll certainly continue through the legal process. Uh, there may be some further reconciliation depending on that uh, decision, but at this point we'll at least be able to, to gain control and stop the interest from accru accruing. With that, is there anybody that would like to speak on the item? Oh, Larry Hartwell, Nine Period and Drive. Uh, I'm glad that you came forward and, and disclosed your violation on the uh, on your trash can. <laughs> um, <laughs> while we're out doing that, remember. Oh, yeah. But remember, the, the person that's going out and looking at all the signs that are illegal, which is literally everyone in town, um, they can also do that. <laughs> so on to this item here. Um, it looked pretty benign on the agenda, but something basic was missing, like, okay, what is the tax abatement? How much is it? Oh, it's about a half a million dollars. I think it should have been in the, in the board package for tonight. I mean, it wasn't there, and I don't know where are we going with this. Have we spent 100000 200000 in legal fees? Um, with a court settlement, can it end up being 2 or $3 million? But at least we could have had the half a million dollars uh, listed there and something more than just a benign entry like we, like we saw on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on the item? Susan Hamill, uh, 3 Bay Street. Um, I'm certainly in favor of getting, making these payments. 7% um, interest is a lot more than uh, we can get anywhere else. So, um, Yeah, 463000 is, uh, as I understand it, the minimum amount that the town can expect to pay. And the final total, um, pending the outcome of, this, uh, of the court, um, could be considerably more money. It would be great if the town could disclose what is the range, what is the range of possibilities so that as we're starting to think about next year's budget and as the voters are considering um, the public safety building bond issue, if, if we were looking at a $4 million charge that the town might have to pay uh, on this abatement ultimately, which we really don't know. Um, uh, it would be nice to know what the range might be. And um, it's, I don't know, you know, what confidentiality or what, um, why that couldn't be disclosed. In, in a case like this, typically courts have found the penalty to be uh, between X and Y. Um, in spite of the fact that our Board of Assessment Review has made a decision, um, made their final decision. And uh, I don't, I did have a couple of, um, there, how does that rule of $400,000, anything over 400 goes out to voters um, if it's gonna be bonded? Um, how does that apply here? Um, Will the town be required to pay 
legal fees um, since they basically uh, were found at fault. And um, it would really be nice to know what's the total amount the town has spent on legal fees since this began. And I've heard 500000 not 100000 500000 I know um, how expensive these things can get. And this has been going on for a long time. And I think that's an important, important to know. And, uh, and then when it's all said and done, finally, we can put this behind us. Let's look back at this and what can we learn from it as a town and as a town council and, and the, the staff, everybody involved? Because um, if something like this came up again um, in the future, it would be great to uh, have those lessons fresh in mind. Any other public comments? Not seeing any. Um, I would like to answer a couple of the questions that were, um, before we begin the conversation, that were asked. Um, and I'll have the manager chime in if I go down the wrong path. Or, but my basic understanding is that, first of all, the regarding the rule of the $400,000 that's within the charter, that only applies to general obligation bonds. So if we send something out for bonding, then it does have to go to the voters if it's $400,001 or even $400,099. Um, so because this is coming from undesignated fund, it's like any other expense and it's actually just simply approved by the council as a whole. And does it require five votes? Like, is it required, or is it, no, just a roll call vote? Because it's okay. an expenditure? Does it require, yeah. It's just majority. majority. Okay. Um, regarding the legal fees, um, my understanding um, that it's public, uh, public knowledge, it's, I don't know if it's ever been asked. I have never been asked. Um, the legal fees are about $280,000 to date, which covers four years' worth of litigation and appeals and other activities from the, um, from the attorneys. Is that about right? No, actually, it's about three hundred and sixty. dollars Oh, I uh, apologize. And that, and that does not include, and I can find this out, I just don't have it available to me right now, um, assistance provided to the Board of Assessment Review. They provide, uh, we provide separate legal counsel for them as well. Um, the last question um, was about uh, what can we learn from that, and that's really an opinion, so I'm not really going to go into the, kind of that question because I have an opinion regarding that on my own. Um, the other piece I wanted to, what was the other question? There was I one more. Uh, the question is what's the, uh, what are the range, what's the range oh, what's of exposure here, I guess? Um, I'd have to refer to you to. All I can say is uh, two days ago, or Late last week, um, briefs were filed, and so that was our first hint at uh, what plaintiffs are seeking. And uh, frankly, their percentages, I've not calculated them out. I believe those documents uh, can be made public, and, and I'll uh, certainly allow people to have access to those if you like. Yeah. Um, and then the last question was um, that I remember was um, not only on the range, um, the baseline is the settlement that the Board of Assessment and the, basically the council has, has understood that um, that baseline will not go any lower. So even though it is an appeal, that's going to be the baseline. So why not try to make the settlement today? Um, the second is, is that um, from what I understand, this range um, for an initial, uh, you know what, I'm going to hold off because I'm, I'm seeking opinion, so I apologize. But um, with that, is there a motion from council? Mm -hmm. And a second? Second. Is there any comments or questions from council? I'll, I'll try and keep it not opinionated. I mean, the fact of the matter is that this is a legal proceeding and there's two parties in every legal proceeding. Uh, I don't, don't necessarily, I think once, once it's settled and finally um, completed to the satisfaction of both parties, I think it would be very good to have a debrief and a discussion of the parameters around it. But until that time, I think we need to just um, uh, do the, 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 the base bottom that we talked about through uh, the assessment, uh, the Board of Assessments decision. We know that that's the minimal amount. We can't change the proceedings at all. We're in the process of that, so I think we, we need, to, need to minimize whatever fiscal losses that we can. Other comments or questions? I did want to... Councilor Hayes, would you raise your hand? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I support doing this because as, as it's been stated, there's a minimum amount known. There's interest accruing every single day. And as, as I share, the interest payments alone are about $2,200 a month. So at least taking this step now 
turns off that interest clock, which I think is just a prudent thing for us to do at this point in time. <clears throat> um, I did want to answer, there was an additional question about um, pack, um, what, why things weren't included in the package for the public. I did want to clarify that both the language of the motion as well as what was provided um, was given under legal di uh, legal direction, our town, council, our town council's uh, legal advice. Um, so that's what we've provided, and it's based upon basically the confidentiality of what is still pending before the appeal of uh, the appeals court. Um, is how I understand that. Um, I think that this is fiscally responsible, but it's somewhat inconvenient given the circumstances around what we're looking at financially in the town. Um, but it's absolutely necessary uh, because it recognizes that there is a, at least a bottom. We don't know where the top is going to go. But I hope um, that in this discussion and conversation um, that there is absolute clear transparency because what people don't understand because of the comments that are being made is that this started out the actual loss to the, to the claimants was $13,000 and they're receiving $471,000 and they're arguing for more, up in the millions of dollars. So as soon as that becomes clear and transparent to this community, I hope they understand why we have been so defensive in this and protecting the town. Because it's astronomical on what is happening behind the scenes. Any other comments, questions? I just want to be clear, this, uh, this motion gives me broad authority to use up to uh, use fund balance to satisfy the full obligation should, uh, should it be necessary. Uh, there are monies in FY18 budget called the overlay, the express purpose of which is to pay abatements. So I'll do a final calculation. I may choose to use, I, I don't use all of that because uh, we'll need to fund other abatements presumably th through the course of the year, but there may be some funds in FY18 that can be applied toward this payment and therefore use of fund balance will be that much less. Uh, once I finalize that evaluation, I'll certainly advise you of that. But this does give me the broad authority to use uh, to go uh, for the full amount from fund balance should it be necessary. That's Kevin. So, uh, and I'll defer to the town manager for this. Would it be possible to explain, um, how, can I, how can I say this? Um, what, this doesn't necessarily resolve the case. It could be. Could you explain where, what the, why we're, not necessarily why we're doing, we know why we're doing this, but, but that this doesn't resolve this issue. There is still potential through the legal proceedings, and stop me if I go too far here, that the, the penalty for the town could be greater if the court rules in favor of the plaintiffs. Yes, it certainly could be. Okay. Yes, that's, that's what's on appeal as we speak. And as has been characterized, this payment that we've calculated, and we've picked a point in time, this is as of October 6, assuming that's when we process and make payment, uh, it would be the floor. It wouldn't be less than this. It could be more. Uh, our legal counsel, well, I'll, I won't get into the strategy, but... Um, I just want to be clear, this doesn't settle this no, issue. No, by no means. It okay. simply is, uh, is acting on the Board of Assessment Review's decision. Yeah. Any other comments? Not seeing any. All in favor of the motion. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to order number 17-097, it is an, um, sorry, act on, um, act to adopt the fiscal year 2018 school budget resolutions as required by state statute. This is presented to us by the school department. I'd like to ask the manager to give us a high level overview. Yes, this is a fairly routine procedure, um, though it's been a long time in coming. Um, we finally do have a school budget and the school is required to the Department of Education to um, place the, the approved amounts in the uh, authorized categories, if you will, and that's what this accomplishes. I'm not seeing any other, um, sorry, not having any other um, comments from the manager. I'm going to open up to public comment. Anybody that would like to speak? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Any questions, comments from council? Not seeing any, all those in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Moving on to order number 17-098. It's an act on the request pursuant to order number 16-024 for the town council to review and approve the design and sitting, sitting of 
Siting. Siting, sorry, of outdoor recreation amenities within Memorial Park as presented by the manager. Would the manager give an overview? Yes, uh, this council may recall, uh, I'm not sure if all of you are actually seated at the time. Uh, this matter was really a, a budget matter and on May 18th, 2016, uh, the council had some discussion around this issue. I think you may have received some commentary from the public as well. And there was a directive given to staff to uh, work with the appropriate committees, namely the senior advisor group, who really spawned this idea in the first instance, and that the count and, and was further clear that they wanted these facilities to be located somewhere in Memorial Park, and that you'd like to see the final uh, result. And through the course of many months working with the public safety advisory group in terms of their process and conducting a bit of the uh, initial phase, if you will, of a master plan of our campus here. Um, there were a number of different proposals and uh, Todd Souza, Director of Community Services, is here tonight to share with you uh, the kind of the final concept plan. Um, so if you'll indulge, uh, Todd's been patient and if you give him five minutes, he can give you a quick overview. Uh, thank you. Um, Again, as Mr. Hall said, this project was going on beginning of the year. Uh, I arrived in end of April, so coming in this project. Um, the initial design um, was to use the existing skate park and relocate that as a primary choice for the location of this community gaming area, even though it was driven by the uh, senior advisory committee, kind of looking at how it affects the entire community and just not but taking in those factors. Um, so looking at that, the skate park area, um, we met with staff, we met with the senior advisory board, um, we had a, a survey online, and this is him, I got an email today requesting um, later this or late this afternoon regarding the survey. The survey was a loose survey that we did with um, a piece of paper and kind of filling out choices with at the senior activities. We only received 30 of those back, but they kind of ranked out what they'd like to see. Um, we had a lot of communication with the public um, after attending um, public safety meetings and how it would affect this area and the park, um, some of the initial thoughts about having the, the section at the um, skate park was um, close parking and access to the back of a potential public safety building. Um, one of the final designs of the public safety building was the road would be one way which would lead to parallel parking. And after talking with the seniors, that's a difficult challenge to parallel park. Um, so rather than relocating two projects, we started looking at other alternatives. Um, and uh, down by, I think you have designs, down by the Memorial Park concession area between the soccer field and the back of the concession area um, was a choice that met the needs where we had, we had parking, we had access to the facilities, um, and um, so that's when we started working with the other groups um, and other departments. Um, at that point, working with our planning department, uh, public Works and Community Services uh, came up with this this kind of uh, level design. The, the design that you saw showed a retaining wall on it, um, and just after our final outlay with Public Works, if this goes forward, um, we've, we've kind of reconfigured just a tweak to be able to take that wall away and not have to ex uh, have that expense and have everything on one flat level at that sub-level, um, which will, which will, which will uh, reduce the cost of the, um, the project. Um, uh, and so based on the public safety, we decided to move that. Um, looking at that gamer area, we've got parallel parking, like I said. Um, I think we've, we can stretch our dollar. We can definitely do it for under cost um, and kind of keeping that cost as low as possible. Um, and uh, I, again, the seniors for the ease of the access and the comfort of being close. The one thing you saw in the kind of the uh, Google overlay that I did, uh, nothing professional by any, um, one of the comments they, that they liked about was having things spread out a little bit so you weren't kind of one activity on top of another and a lot of those have flexible footprints where if we decide to build uh, grass bocce courts over here or we're doing beanbag games over here, um, which are increasingly popular for all ages and not just se uh, seniors, um, those footprints can be moved at a later date. It's not a structure that the pickleball courts would be the two fixes. So that was kind of the primary focus. Um, and I, and I can't say enough about our work with our planning department and public works for taking on this challenge because those are contracted services that we don't have to put out um, that we're doing in-house with our own resources on their schedule. So um, uh, that's kind of where we are right now um, with this project. We've got, we've got everything in place pending approval. 
um, to start putting this ball in motion if that's what you choose. Any questions? Council Cazzo. So um, how did this plan take into consideration the recommendations from the consultants who were doing the master plan for the campus? How did that play into this decision? Um, as far as the ma when they looked at initially the parking lot, I mean the skate park area, um, we didn't get see any really feedback back because it's not changing any of our like it's not a future expansion for anything else, facility um, or a building. Um, it's kind of it's kind of tucked into an area that's um, it's a graded hill right now, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, planning didn't have any concerns as far as that it was actually one of their original recommendations to look at that area. Well, well, yeah, I wasn't referring to necessarily the planning department. I was oh. referring to the consultants. Uh, didn't we hire a consultant as part of the public safety to evaluate, preliminarily evaluate the master plan for the campus? So I guess yeah. what I'm what I'm asking is how how does this fit in with the master plan? Um, was this area designated as a recreational area in the master plan? And is there an outcome that we can see from the council from that report? Gotcha. I did not consult with the consultants. I just consulted okay. with the planning department. Okay. Um, the, pre and the predated time. Yeah. 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 No, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I Memorial that. Park, I viewed as a recreational area. Sure. So I didn't take it as we were taking an alternate site for a different use. Right. So mm -hmm. Frankly, with the council's direction that it be somewhere in Memorial Park, you really You've limited our options in, in many respects. Uh, the, the master campus, campus plan coordination with the public safety was really important in terms of uh, their roadway, how far it encroached on the park, uh, whether there's any kind of on-street parking opportunities to help in, enhance. So there was great collaboration there. Um, I don't think they had any great concern other than they wanted th they wanted us to make sure that these were convenient to parking and to existing facilities and. Frankly, uh, this location, uh, the other end of the park, really is a better location in so many respects than um, using the skate park. Yeah, if I could just follow up, though, I, I mean, uh, part of my concern, and I said it before with the public safety building. So, is, Councilor, if sorry. we can, because we haven't had a chance to hear public comments as well, okay, so before fine. we yep. get into a dialogue or a debate, yep, yep. if there are any technical questions, on, yeah, I mean, your first question was perfect, but if yep. there are any technical questions of staff, I'd like to be able to open it up for public comment. Yes, Councilor? Just, just one question for, through the town manager. Mm -hmm. um, you said it comes in under budget. What well, is What was the budget? Under cost, you said. Yeah, so what, uh, initially the budget? the budget was for this project to have all these kind of identified things. Yes. $100,000 was set aside for this project, and that Did was... It was in CFP. I think it was two budgets ago, two actually. Two budgets ago. Yes. Yeah. So is it part, sort of a restricted fund type? We funded it in the mill rate. Two years ago, basically, right? Yeah, I believe we've. Uh, I, I don't recall if it was appropriate. If it was, we've carried that money over, so it's available for this use. Yes. So you said it's. Un so the budget was a hundred. So what's it? What's it coming? Right, and it depends on uh, how the phases go. Right now, when we're looking at construction of the pickleball courts, using our resources through the town, is about forty-four thousand dollars to create those two courts, um, and then the other amenities of choices that will continue to go through the process if we want to have grass plots. We're trying not to say. Here, here it all. Here's everything. Taking one thing, surveying a little more. What type of courts do we want? Do we want, you know, cement? Do we want it here? And as we, we're kind of looking at as phases. As this is not a, a money that I see that's going to go away. To make sure we're prudent with how we spend those funds. Right. The, the other, the other big cost is the pavilion. That's, right. That was one of the things they asked for, and yep. and that can be um, quite pricey depending on what the design. And so I think we want to kind of. Um, search that a little further and understand right. what the need there is and if there's another way to accomplish uh, the concern. Right. So I guess my question is that we to do everything that's on here that you've shown us, is that 100? No, everything except for the pavilion, like I said in my memo. So how much more is the pavilion? I know it's... It, 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 again, pavilions can range if we buy material and build it ourselves, if it's something that's fabricated, if it's how the size of it. A lot of the seniors were talking about um, a picnic area. Right. That was shaded and, and away from the sun. So that's something that, again, it, it could be as grand or as simple as we want it to be. So we haven't done a lot of it because we knew that was a kind of a bigger piece to this. Um, you know, you start getting into it, and um, size is, is, the, is the in the design of it. It's just just a ballpark. I mean, how big of a bread box is it? I mean, in my opinion, we should build something that houses because we do events out there. Like we just did our 55 plus barbecue, right? And we had uh, 20 tables out there. 
under their tent, which we rent. And so to me, it would be something that would house eight to 10 picnic tables with the flexibility of being a little tighter. So you're probably talking like a 30 by 50 pavilion to make that happen. So you're talking 30 grand, 40? 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars, depending if it's vinyl wood, we build it, it's a contracted kit, is it powered, is there lights? All those choices to what you're actually considering. If there's any other technical questions, or if there's not any other technical questions, I'd like to thank you uh, for staying and sharing. But um, open it up for any public comments. Is there anybody that would like to speak? Good evening. Jean Marie Caterina, 311 Gorham Road. Uh, as you are probably aware, I'm a member of the Senior Advisory Board, and I know that the seniors are pretty impatient, shall I say, that uh, they'd really like to see this. Uh, plan done and accomplished. Uh, it has been on the drawing board for a couple of years. I know that the attitude of many of the seniors is, geez, we aren't asking for a whole lot. Can't we just have this small recreation area? Uh, as far as the pavilion is concerned, again, the, um, <clears throat> my understanding is that their concern is, you know, the sun. And I can say for a fact, when I was younger, I used to be able to lay on the beach and all day and all night. But now that I'm older, no. You know, I can't sit in the sun for uh, that amount of time. So even if it's something as simple as a pergola, I believe they would be happy with that. It's just the shade shade aspect of it. So uh, I, I also know seniors were very disappointed to see that there was something written in some blog or whatever that, you know, you know there's no money for this and why are we spending this money? And, um, you know, again, just consider who who this is primarily serving seniors are the ones who are asking for it, but it will serve the whole community. And I personally think it would be a great addition, so I uh, certainly hope that you will all uh, support it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the public that would like to speak? Oh, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. I wish I didn't have to keep getting up here and saying negative things, but it's the way it rolls. Um, so we have $823,000 that we've uh, disclosed tonight of payments and uh, legal fees for the town council and an unknown amount of legal fees for the tax appeals board. And that's our minimum number that's been established tonight is our minimum number. Um, the pavilion, the senior rec area, all good things. Um, a dome over the... the athletic field would be a good thing too. But we have a million dollars baseline expense here on the tax abatement. I think the hundred thousand dollars should be not spent on this. This should be you know, our reserves are down, uh certainly on the town side, we know the school side too, and we know what next year looks like both on the town and, and uh, the school side. So I would I hate to say it, but I think we should defer this expenditure at this time. Any other comments? I'm Sue Hamill, Three Day Street. Um, my only comment about this is uh, they've waited a long time for this. I would. M I would just want to be sure that what we are what we are building and constructing is indeed what they want. And um, I participated in a, an online survey monkey that was up on the community services website, and I'm I'm just curious to find out how many participants um, weighed in on that and what were the results. Um, it was available to anybody in the town to to um to answer and um uh you know it's they have waited a really long time and we've they've been asking for a senior center for forever and um this is something that clearly they're only going to be able to use for part of the year i think it makes a lot of sense and um just just to be sure though that what we're what we're going to be putting out there is in fact what they want and um, and that you've really done the homework to make sure and that these groups have responded and um, and are with it 
Any other comments? Not seeing any. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Comments or questions? Councilor Chiazzo. So now I'll vent my frustration. Um, I, I, I'm, I recall when we put the public safety building together, part of the discussion was to, we, I think we pulled another 45000 or something out of an account so that we would have the consultant do a master plan for the campus. The reason I'm harping on this and focusing on this right now is because we do have long range issues that we are trying to accommodate, whether it's school related or uh, 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 community, se community centers and that kind of stuff. So I do appreciate, I'm not going to not support this project. I voted for it, put the money in there. My frustration is I want to see the master plan, but we, we keep doing these projects and we're, we're doing them immediately right now without looking at the long term. And, and I'd like to see a master plan so that we can incorporate this into the right areas at the right time so that we don't have to eventually move this stuff at some point. I like the fact that it's flexible. The pickleball court's obviously the only fixed asset there. That's fine. Um, I guess my frustration is, is that we, we paid 45000 for a master plan evaluation, and I thought we were going to see something out of that. So if I, was if I misunderstood that, then I apologize, but I thought that was the intention. Yes, there is all intentions of doing a full master campus plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we accelerated the portion, including Memorial Park, only because of this, and more importantly, the public safety building demanded that attention be paid there first. Mm -hmm. We have not advanced the rest of the plan yet. We're, I think we have a kickoff meeting to restart that in 10 days or so. And that will involve a whole bunch of other stakeholders. School is an active participant at that. Certainly the library, they're very interested. Um, and so I think what you're referring to is certainly will be coming. Uh, with respect to these facilities, again, with all due respect, when the council directs that these facilities are to be somewhere in Memorial Park, that really limits us and there's not a universe of opportunity. And given the fact that these facilities need to be conveniently and appropriately located, um, they're not, a, again, a universe of, of opportunity. So um, I think you'll be satisfied when you see the larger plan and planning process, and I'll certainly make you aware of that if any and all of you want to be part of it. Uh, but that, that work in, is, is really just uh, commencing. I'm going to ask Councilor Rowan to speak because he's also the liaison to uh, the committee. So if you can sure. So uh, the uh, Mr. Susan has been uh, to the uh, 55 plus advisory um, board meetings um, for several months over over a long period of time, and this has been um, actively discussed. Certainly, they don't represent all the seniors in town, but they definitely are um, some very uh, vocal and, and um, active ones, um, and they're they're very supportive of of um, this site. Um, they like the activities. I think there's some discussion around, you know, some of them would like to see shuffleboard included, but I think this is a, indicated that this is still kind of flexible in terms of what's going to be there. The other thing that's really nice about this plan is that other than the pickleball courts and the pavilion that when it when and if it's eventually built, is that um, it's all pretty flexible in terms of chessboards can be moved, cornhole boards can be moved, um, croquet can certainly be played pretty much on any grassy grassy area, horseshoes, um, so they bocce, yeah. Uh, so, um, so in general, I'm, I'm incredibly supportive of this. I saw a couple of hands up here first. Councilor Sinclair? Um, I guess, you know, I, w I was a liaison to see you, so I've been kind of familiar with the conversations and did support when we originally put the money in the budget. <clears throat> Although I'm, I would be more comfortable if we really had a much better handle on what is what it is we're going to do, definitely, and what the budget's going to be for it, to, to say, it might be, you know, forty or forty-five thousand, or it might be one hundred and fifty thousand. I'd like to have that fleshed out a little bit more. So I don't know if we could. I guess I'd make a motion at some point after the discussion about. I would like to get a little more definitive answers. I think the questions asked from the audience about if it is in flux about what we're going to build. Let's let's get it right. Let's make sure we know the budget and make sure we're informed about what, what we're approving because we are facing a challenging budget season. So big difference between fifty and one hundred fifty. So. So, and I guess my question to the chair is tonight, are we approving the conceptual design or are we just also approving the expenditure to deliver the conceptual design? My we are only, because the um, expenditure has already been approved. Right. Only for 100 though, not for Yes. Right. Right. And, 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 that, and that would be a limit. We cannot spend any more yeah. than authorized. So right. to give you comfort, uh, right. there's certainly, we Plus have 100. Pavilion, so it's not. If the pavilion Our intent is to do as much as we possibly can within the existing budget, right. and we don't have a fine enough detail. It's quite possible <coughs> we're able to do all okay. of it. 
I, I didn't understand. I thought yeah. it was open ended. So. And then, no. and, and any additional expenditures, so if they're able to do everything except for the pavilion in, under 100000 and it costs them more for the pavilion, they're going to have to come back right. and make the request for the additional yeah. funding. Thank you. Councilor St. Clair. Um, two things. One, it, it's my opinion, this is the least we can do for the seniors in this town. Um, we are constantly, constantly talking about the schools and uh, uh, not that there's anything wrong with that because that's a huge part of our community, but there's a whole other part of our community that has been very patiently waiting for something, anything. My, these people, I, clearly, I don't want to spend $100,000. I, I don't. In the state that we're in, it's, I, it, it, it bothers me. But the money's there. It's been there. We voted on it two years ago. They asked. I mean, they've been asking for something from us. So, uh, to me, this is... Uh, I can't, it's a no-brainer. I mean, the patience that these people have had, and, uh, you know, like one speaker we had, you know, we're not talking about, about, you know, kids have time. Some of these seniors don't. <laughs> so they, they don't have a lot of time. So the sooner we can get this done, let's just get it done. Um, and the other piece of this, um, for the overall scope of Memorial Park, is that, um, which we learned a lot about going through the process of the police department, there is not a lot of space left on our campus. We are running out of space rapidly. And not only that, um, but to Councillor Chiazzo's point a little bit, the space that there is there, like some people have made comments to me like, oh, there's, all, there's tons of space, oh, there's space everywhere. Okay, you might see a parcel of land, but that doesn't mean it's buildable. That doesn't mean we can put a parking lot there. That doesn't mean we can put anything there. So we have with this where this location is, we didn't have a lot of options. So not only are we running out of space, but because of the clientele that's going to be using this area, we have to be very conscious of where this went. Um, they had to have access to handicapped parking. They had to have access to parking. They had to have access to facilities. They're not asking for a lot. For the amount of things that we do in this town, this is not a lot. It's something I, like, it burns my biscuits when people <laughs> have problems with these, these seniors in this town. And if you look at the numbers, the seniors in this town are, they're going to start overtaking some of you guys. So we really need to make sure that we're treating them. And they, they, they have earned and are due that respect um, even more so. So I think, um, well, I guess obviously clearly you know where I stand. I'm <laughs> going to support this. Any other comments, Councilor Foley? Um, so I wasn't on the council when this, when that money was approved, but I certainly would have supported it then. And I I agree. It's time they've been waiting patiently, and it's time to do something. To me, it seems that uh, the space has been well thought out. Um, you know what I love about this project is that it's for me it's truly intergenerational space. And we talk about the need to bring, you know, those pieces together, and that's what this does. And so the one thing that I would be really fearful of losing would be that pavilion because of the sun and the heat and the rain. Um, because if I'm a grandparent, I mean, I know even my own mother, I don't want her out in the sun for four hours watching her grandkids. You know, if she has a shaded space and it's located near the back, it's perfect. You know, so... Um, for me, that's almost the most important thing because something like bocce, I mean, I have bocce in my car right now. We could go play in the parking lot. I, that's why I love bocce because it can be played anywhere. Right. So it doesn't have to have a ring and a sign that says this is the only place you can play bocce. You can, you know, do that. And pickleball um, is an interesting little sport. I don't know much about it, <laughs> but um, it, it was hot, hot, hot down in Florida. I can tell you that when I spent the, year, the winter down there. And so I'm excited to learn. Yeah. So I... Uh, yeah, I fully support this. I get that we are um, looking at tight budgets. I would like to see, you know, more definitive pieces around the budget exactly for the project, but I think this is a must-do. Second to a pool, but uh, we're, we don't have that in the <laughs> budget, so. Temple Donovan. Yeah, I support this. Uh, uh, I like the site. It's near existing bathrooms and parking. That's a very efficient design. The space uh, is underutilized at the present time. Uh, this was fully aired <clears throat> when we when we 
put it out two years ago. It's long overdue. Has been a lot of patience exhibited here and some frustration. The pavilion is obviously a good idea. Uh, uh, I like the fact that we're getting good value from the town doing much of the work. $100,000 is all we have. Can't. Uh, we'll see how far we go, but I, uh, I'm very pleased with this. Thank you. Okay. Just one more quick point, so on something that a little bit more on what Councilor Foley touched on, but you know, one thing that we're talking a lot about is, is really trying to bring our town together. And what a fabulous way to integrate more of our town and make it more of a hub if we're helping our seniors have a place to intermingle also at the same time with other residents of town and with the school-aged kids and with um, families and with concerts, in, you know, concerts in the park and things like that. We're just, I think it's going to be a wonderful way for us to start really focusing more on making this town center. Um, and I think that it could really be a great thing if we can figure out, make sure we figure out all of the logistical pieces of it. But I'm really excited about it and I think it's a great, great thing. Great. Um, and just to add, um, one of the most influential people in my life was my grandmother. She was a very strong woman with very strong values. And one of the things she told me when I started doing this was that that two major constituencies, even though they may be the smallest part that you focus in on, are the children, because someday they're going to take care of you when you're in the nursing home. And then it's also the seniors, because your community is built on them. And so I think that this is an obvious start to a bigger issue that we need to focus. And uh, we did receive a request, and I can't remember her name, to give her credit, nor the name of the agency. But um, we've been asked to take into consideration of becoming an age-friendly community. And I think that this is only one small step towards that because it is about providing resources to that segment of the community that is very important. So I am full support of this, um, I'm including if they need an additional $50,000 to build a pavilion. Yes. Um, there's some things you just you have to bite your tongue and just do it. So yeah. um, with that, if there's no other comments, I'd like to move the question. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to order number 17-099, act on the request to set the date, time, and location of the municipal elections for Tuesday, November 7, 2017, to appoint the warden, set the hours for voter registration, and act on appointments of election ballot clerks pursuant to Chapter 200, Article 7, nomination and elections, and authorize the town clerk to make any additional appointments as necessary as recommended by the clerk. Is there any comment from the public? Not seeing any, um, just as a high level before, um, well, I, yeah, before we take. Um, so this is available at the town clerk's office, obviously, because it's a very um, lengthy document, so I'm not going to read the entire document, but I do think it's important I'm trying to find the language about the dates and time. So um, I did want to make it clear for the public that the polls will be opened on that day, um, November 7th at 7 a.m. and closed at 8 p.m. Absentee ballots will be processed on Monday, November 6, 2017 from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and on Election Day, Tuesday, November 7, 2017 starting at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 7.30 p.m. until done. Um, the Registrar of Voters will hold office hours during regular business hours at the Town Hall and at the polls to correct any errors or changes or change a name or address on the voting list to accept the registration of any person eligible to vote and to accept new enrollments. And did want to mention um, that the location of the election um, will be at the Skyro High School Alumni Gymnasium. So uh, with that, it's all within the context of the document, as well as the names of all of the election workers. Uh, with that, is there is a motion? So moved. And if that, any questions for the clerk or for counsel? Not seeing any, I'm moving the question. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, there are no non-action items. Uh, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. I'll start with Council St. Clair. Oh, thank you. Oh, right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I had, um, I don't think I've given a uh, communications update, but we talked a lot about it tonight, so most of you know what we have um, coming up on our agenda. Um, we're going to obviously try to schedule that, um, that meeting co-meeting with the um, school board communications group. I'm also going to ask that it be um, videotaped and televised 
Usually communications isn't for some reason, just I think because it's our first year maybe. Um, but I am going to ask for that to be videoed so that people can go back and see it because um, I think it's going to be one that people should have access to. Um, and that's it for me for now. Thank you. Councilor Foley. Fine. Um, Conservation Commission did not meet because we all attended the all boards uh, meeting last week. And, uh, but I did want to mention that the Eastern Trail Alliance had a uh, very successful uh, 2017 main lighthouse ride. Um, it's one of their biggest uh, fundraisers and uh, ways in which they raise money uh, for the Eastern Trail Alliance. So that was done very well. That's it. What? Uh, Councilor Hayes? Yeah, a couple things. <coughs> a couple things to report on: um, Coastal Harbor and Shellfish Net, the Coastal Harbor, Coastal Waters and Harbor Commission are looking at. Again, they're kind of debriefing after the summer. Parking still remains kind of a challenge down around the co-op, so they're still kind of struggling through that and trying to figure out things that they can do to help have access for both the public and, and the commercial fisheries. Um, they're also now struggling with there's there's a long waiting list for moorings, and they're finding that the mooring list may not be up, up to date. There's some, some folks that have multiple moorings, so they're trying to weed through sort of the moorings. That's, <coughs> that's coastal. Shellfish um, is kind of, they're, they're kind of, I, I don't know how to put this delicately. Um, there's some leadership issues and some other things, that, but for right now the shellfish is they're kind of, as they start to close in on the issue of licenses again, that always becomes a very, um, a passionate issue for a lot of them, and we're starting that process as, as we are now, so they, they started those conversations. Um, then I'll report on finance committees. Actually, the finance committees have been pretty busy. We did have a joint finance committee Monday night, and I've already kind of reported out that that really was getting together with um, Board of Education Finance Committee and ours, and we kind of talked about what went, what went well with the budget, what didn't kind of brainstorm about things we wanted to do. Um, we also talked about maybe trying to think about how we could do forecasting, and again, that was a it was a lengthy conversation, but a good conversation. I think we'll make some forward progress on that. Um, and then there were some things that we didn't get to and realized that there's a lot of value, and, and I think Councillor Chiesa kind of made reference to it. I think we recognize that we thought we'd worked well together this year as a team and really want to kind of continue that effort and have decided instead in the past we've kind of adjourn and not reconvene until mid-budget season. But we're going to continue to meet regularly and really try to, to start getting a leg up on next year's budget season. Um, so that was sort of the joint finance. We did have a town council finance committee meeting and there's some things on our agenda and I've passed out to you tonight as council members. Two pretty busy schedules and the first one I'd like to have you maybe just take a look at is town and school fund balance. It really kind of gives you an update of where we think we ended up or where we did end up audit, from an audit perspective in 2016. Um, and to walk the takeaway from that is we ended up with about 6.1 million in unassigned reserves. Um, our goal um, was to get to 8.33% of our operating budget. We, that was at 7.72. We put, we did raise our goal and we're moving toward that. But what I wanted to draw your attention to at the very bottom of the page when it says town fund balance, this is on audited numbers as of year end, June 30th, 17. Um, the good news is though actually the town had about a $649,000 surplus, which is great news. Um, we asked a little bit about what contributed to that, and, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. we thought it was really excise taxes the majority. continue to be positive. You did put in some curtailment on expenses toward the tail end of the year that may have had an impact or not. We weren't quite sure. But that sets us up nicely, or at least is a little bit more of a cushion in the reserves as we go into next year. Mm -hmm. That also tells you, again, our goal was to get to 8.33% of reserves of our operating budget. That puts us at 8.16. So again, we, we made steady progress from the prior year. So there's a lot of information here. If you, anybody has any questions, feel free to you know, connect with any of us in the finance community. We can walk you through it. The second document I've handed out, it's this really powerful document, and we have Clarissa Crockett to kind of thank for, thank mm -hmm. for this. She put a lot of work into this. 
And actually what, it, what we've done, and we really wanted to get your input, not necessarily tonight, but just again let us know as you look at this. What we try to do is come up with some, just sort of a dashboard, some metrics that we thought were important that every year we may want to take a look at and see what we're doing. So what you see here is in the middle you have, you know, let's just take debt service as a percent of annual revenues. Um, in 15 it was 12.22%. In 16, it was 11.2 percent. So the green arrow says that that's going down, which is which is a direction where we want it to go. Um, the colorful numbers on the left-hand side this is kind of a work in progress. We need to kind of figure out how to display this. But those are some benchmarks. So it really says if it was 15 or over, that would really be in sort of a danger zone. If it's around 12, that's okay. If it's under 12, that's actually a good place. So you can see the green arrow starts to suggest we're moving in the right direction. So that's kind of mirrored up and down these other mix that we've, we've determined. Our thought here is that, and again, some of these things are blank. We haven't quite figured out the best benchmarks to use. So where you see on the acceptable range, there's still a work in progress for us to determine what we're going to do. Um, this is meant to be as a starting point, just kind of a toe in the sand. Our thought is that around the same time we get our audited financial statements, that we as a town council could take a look at this metric and just say, how are we doing? It's really meant to be a performance metric. Are we headed in the right direction or not? We've had a lot of spirited conversations about what are the right metrics to use. And these aren't set in stones. We're, we're still we're looking at that. And that brings up the sec second subject. As part of that, we are trying to rewrite or review the debt and you know fiscal management policies. A lot of these metrics are embedded in that policy, so we're not sure those are the right metrics, so that's kind of a work in progress for us. Um, and I, you know, we, so we talked, I talked about the year-end financial, we talked about the metrics. Um, we did, I didn't share it, but you, if you go out to our agenda item, we also started to model what our debt service looks like, our principal and debt service out in time. We folded into those numbers. Um, our capital facilities plan that we come up came up with, so we've folded in what the pub, if the public safety building passes, what does that do? So it's just an interesting model. If you guys want to go out and take a look at it, um, and our next meeting will be on the 17th, so I think the 17th of October, um, where we'll continue some of this work. So I think that's my piece. Of, if anybody has any questions on these documents or any thoughts or suggestions, just let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Council Rowan. Thank you. Um, so Scarborough Housing Alliance met. Um, we were discussing um, the recommendations um, that we're obligated to bring back to this body uh, regarding uh, use of the um, uh, fund, the, the balance of the uh, housing funds. Um, uh, specifically, uh, that was uh, part of the stipulation of the um, the. Um, Gateway property on on Haggis when we um, when we changed that contract zone it was we had uh, uh, obligated the the Scarborough Housing Alliance to come back with how we might use those funds to to generate um, uh, more affordable housing in town um, and uh, we are meeting one more time before our next meeting um, and there will be a recommendation from the chair at our at our following meeting so, um, that's doing well. Um, senior, uh, excuse me, the 55 plus uh, program advisory committee met. Um, Mr. Susan was there again, um, and but we were talking about the membership structure. There's um, some debate over the best uh, way to encourage participation to cover costs uh, of, at the different events um, versus um, charging on trips to, to fund that program. Um, there's some uh, concern that you know, hey, the seniors are the only group in town that have to pay a membership fee, but on the other hand, they're also the only group in town that have coffee and snacks at, at their weekly events. Um, so there's some, uh, some debate about the, the right way to structure that moving forward and there, there are more, um, more discussion to come. Um, Councilor Chiazzo. So I'm going to yield to, to Councilor Hayes real quick just to, was, sorry. <laughs> as, as a senior moment, um, <laughs> when we were talking about the metrics, we talked about the, the town metrics that we're choosing about in our joint finance community meeting with the Board of Education, they also have some outcome metrics that they have chosen in a prior year that they're going to kind of similarly put in some type of dashboard Good. that we can take a look at. Too. They're, they're kind of in the process of pulling those out and let us know what they are, but that, that'll be our intent to kind of incorporate them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So uh, transportation uh, hasn't meet, met, excuse me, they're meeting next week. Um, Long-range planning. 
um, Matt, and I'm, unfortunately I, I'm hitting the travel time, so I keep missing those those meetings. So I apologize to them and to the council for not um, being able to detail those meetings. Um, but the most important thing next week is Planet Palooza. So there's a lovely graphic to the left. I don't know if the camera can zoom in on that. Um, that would it'd be nice if that was up during my comments so people could follow along. Um, but Planet Palooza is a is a public design and input process during the, which the community and the town's planning team work jointly to draft a new comprehensive plan for Scarborough. The comprehensive plan will guide future decisions for conservation and growth in Scarborough. During the Planet Palooza, conservations, uh, conversations will occur surrounding land use, transportation, natural resources, parks and open spaces, bikeways, trails, public facilities and services, economic development, as well as community growth development, design, housing and, ident and identify um, and identity, excuse me. So lots and lots and lots of stuff. Um, next week's the big, the big kickoff, the big push. Um, hoping we get a, a really decent turnout. The workshop, opening workshop, is Monday at 6:30 p.m. at Scarborough High School. Then on Tuesday, uh, there are technical meetings scheduled throughout the day at the space above the Scarborough grounds on Route One. Uh, at 9 a.m., there'll be sustainability. At 10:30, natural environment and resiliency. 2.30, the economy and jobs, 4 p.m., mobility and health, and 5.30, built environment and design. And then there will be a closing presentation on Thursday, the 28th, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Tuesday isn't the only uh, opportunity. Wednesday is kind of an open session. So if you missed anything and if you're not available, I know these are during the day. It's difficult for necessarily everybody to meet those times. Um, there's, they will be uh, available above at the same location above Scarborough Grounds from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on Tuesday and Wednesday and then 9 a.m. to noon on Thursday. So ample opportunity for everybody and anybody to stop by, um, put their two cents in uh, and, and get an idea of how we're developing a comprehensive plan and participate. So. Um, and if you have any questions or if more information is needed, there's a separate website dedicated just for this process. It's www.scarboroughengaged.org. And that's dedicated. You can link it through our town website. There's a little box in the lower left corner. Uh, or you can go directly to that. And that'll have all kinds of information and interactive surveys and a place for uh, information exchanges as well during the entire process. So, thank, thank you. you. Council Donovan? Uh, uh, planning board action, the only thing really material was the uh, rezoning of Hagus Parkway that was endorsed. Uh, uh, public hearing before us tonight. Uh, ordinance committee, we're going to move up the meeting uh, schedule for the first week of October up to uh, September 28th, really with the intention of trying to move meetings up because we still have business to conduct and we want to get everything done before the end of the town council year in November. Uh, uh, attended the all board uh, summit uh, and we worked on the comprehensive plan. Um, uh, the energy committee met this morning, 7.30. Uh, the food waste diversion pilot program uh, 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 has been concluded. Uh, clearly raised the consciousness uh, and interest in composting. We're seeing that in a tremendous return of surveys. Uh, unbelievable number of surveys out of the people who were involved. Uh, the Pleasant Hill drop-off site, uh, we're having to expand the number of barrels uh, that Garbage to Garden is putting down there because of its popularity. Uh, we also covered the uh, energy plan for the comprehensive plan, and that will be coming to us through the comprehensive plan process. But the Energy Committee has been working diligently on this for, that for months. Uh, the LED streetlight conversion project uh, RFP, RFP uh, has been issued. Uh, we're going to select a contractor uh, and consultants in the weeks ahead, uh, really following right on the heels of Falmouth and Portland. Uh, installation will be the late spring of uh, next year. And that's it for committee. Thank you. Um, two items, or a couple of items for me as chair. I uh, did want to mention that um, last week I did send out a notification to the council, but I wanted to make a public notification that um, the, um, as chair of the ad hoc elections committee, um, Mr. Freeman and I did make uh, the two appointments. Those two appointments were Jim Elkins of Scarborough as well as Anthony DeSoto. Um, some of you may know Mr. Elkins. He serves on our long-range planning committee. 
Um, he also serves as our delegate to the Portland Regional Chamber and serves on the Executive Committee um, and has been in town for many years. And Mr. DeSoto um, has also been in town for, I want to say, about 10 years. And his background is that he recently was um, a graduate of Leadership Maine, in which his capstone focused um, on municipal services, uh, mostly in the northern Maine area with one particular town. So for both of us, we thought it was a, a really nice complement to the process. We did have our first meeting uh, this past week. We have another one coming up, um, and we uh, expect to uh, you know, report out in a, an executive summary document what uh, transpired in the conversations that we had. Um, so um, I'll report on that later. I did want to make notice that um, because of uh, commitments, not only as the current chair, but uh, just in, in work, um, I have resigned or will be resigning from the Maine Municipal Association's Legislative Policy Committee, in which I was elected. Um, I simply cannot travel uh, the travel requirements up to Augusta for the meetings. So there will be a future agenda item. I'm going to ask the council to appoint uh, the assistant manager, Larissa Crockett, who is already our delegate as the um, actual, um, she, she is the assistant, or alternate delegate, um, and appoint her as the, uh, the actual delegate, um, which will provide some stability in that position, and then council take up uh, the assistant or the alternate position later on, maybe in the new council, because uh, it's not really that critical at this time. Also wanted to mention that I have left um, and not able to serve this year on the County Budget Finance Committee. Last year, I've served on for many years, but last year I served as, finance, as the chair. Um, they are looking for um, people who might be interested. Um, it is a, a very interesting insight into county government um, and the reli uh, reliance on that. And so serving on that finance committee um, is an elected position. Um, I should say appointed because it's, it's um, appointed by the commissioners. Uh, so if there is an interest from any counselor here, it's a great experience. Um, I just can't serve in it, uh, the capacity based on work schedule. So uh, come and see me or talk to me, and I'll be happy to introduce you to our county commissioner, uh, Neil Jamison. And did also want to mention that SEDCO has their annual meeting coming up on October 3rd, um, which is always a wonderful time in which we recognize our business community as well as um, get to hear how uh, the community has progressed uh, with its business. Uh, new businesses and um, current business profile. Um, with that, um, moving on to the town manager's report. Yes, a few quick items. Um, Councilor Rowan, just to jog my memory, uh, very interested to report, or pleased to report that Gateway Commons, the, the, uh, the apartment complex on Haggis Parkway, uh, had a construction meeting here today. Uh, as, uh, as I suspected, they are very anxious to get going, and, and I think they're going to build at a pace much quicker than they had originally planned. They're really trying to uh, meet that market where it is today. So that's certainly good encouraging news that that project is moving ahead and, and you should see a flurry of activity in the next uh, 10 days or so. Um, as part of the comprehensive plan process, one of the things that um, I'm really interested in is uh, it's really a re return on investment analysis. It's going to be a tool that we'll have available to us uh, that will help us understand and it's a very highly developed model that has several hundred inputs and these inputs the consultants were here uh, for a day and a half getting kind of the, the local calibration, so uh, really kind of fine-tuning those inputs to make sure they make sense for us. Uh, but essentially, uh, you'll be able to plug in uh, different uh, land use types on land and understand uh, return on that investment in terms of tax revenue, uh, impact analysis. So I think you'll be interested, given the fact that this council sat through kind of a similar discussion, uh, this tool is going to be available to us going forward as well. So uh, that will be very interesting to see how that develops. Also for the public's benefit, um, Avenue 2 is um, made its way through uh, the parties at this point and things look favorable that, such that I believe the matter will come back before Council at your October 4th meeting. That's what we're shooting for at this point. There seemed to be a genuine interest to move this uh, as soon as as possible, particularly in front of this council, since uh, you're familiar with the issues and, and the parties. Um, I've talked to Chairman Baybine. Uh, it seems appropriate to perhaps have a workshop. Maybe it doesn't need to be a full hour, but the intent of that would be to kind of provide you an update of what's changed since you've seen this last, and then potentially have action on that same evening uh, for the council to do its part to approve the discontinuance and the related legal documents. So very pleased that that seems to be coming uh, to fruition. Also, uh, a bit housekeeping, but community services, um, one of the things that they do, it's um, many, many things, but one of the things that's, I think, well received by the community is passport service. 
uh, that's become so popular, uh, and for any of you that have been up to that office, there's just a short counter space, and many times passport pro processing, particularly for a full family, can take a lengthy period of time. So we're trying to get our uh, to manage that a bit better, and we're going to do it by appointment only. We've done some notices out to the public, and so far things have been accepted well. Uh, we had a fairly liberal um, allowance there, but that will just give us the ability to make sure we're properly staffed. And then we'll do one or two or three uh, Saturdays throughout the course of the year. I think uh, last year we did over 100 passports on that one Saturday. So it's a service that's, I think, well needed and, 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 well, deserved and uh, well appreciated. And lastly, you'll be pleased to know we did receive a dividend check from the uh, uh, Maine Municipal Association's um, uh, risk pool. And the total dividend this year is uh, $31,035. And that's made up of about $20,000 for workers' comp and the remainder from our property casualty. So that certainly suggests that uh, our performance, we're, we're outperforming the expectations and as a member community uh, get to enjoy that savings by way of the dividend. Good. Thank you. Council member comments, I'll start with Council Chiazzo. Uh, uh, nothing this week, it's been a crazy week. Uh, so I'm just um, appreciative of all the work we're doing and um, budget season starting already again for the next year, so um, looking forward to just continuing the work. Council Hayes? Yeah, no, similarly. I'm, I'm fine. Thanks. Council Sinclair? Can I ask a question? Are you? I said no. <laughs> still do it when you. No, of course you can. Of course you can. I'll just leave. Oh, you speak up and everybody can hear you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, do you remember? I. I I believe it's September, and maybe someone, else, maybe other people will remember. But we're supposed to get um, a report back from the um, affordable housing group. Um, do you is that being prepared? Is that due in September? October first is the due date, and, it was? and okay. we're planning to. Uh, the chair of the committee is planning to come before the um, council at our next meeting. Oh, oh, okay, great. So for not for the whole presentation, but just to give us an update? To, or? to give an update and kind of what, what the latest and greatest thinking from, from that committee. Okay. So I, I, think, yeah. I just wanted to make sure I didn't, I wanted to keep that, keep, mm -hmm. keep sight of that. Um, I wanted to, I thought I had something else. Um, I don't usually do counselor comments, but uh, I think that's it for me. Councilor Foley? Plan Palooza next week. <laughs> I'll check it out. Yep, mm -hmm. that's it. Council Rowan? Nothing, thank you. Council Donovan? Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, Metro Regional Coalition met uh, as part of uh, GPCOG. Uh, uh, it was the p points of interest for us. I won't cover too much of it. Cape Elizabeth uh, uh, Town Council banned all marijuana sales uh, and shop uh, uh, two weeks ago. Wow. Uh, City of Portland is under some considerable pressure to uh, uh, to uh, ha advance all of the aspects, uh, uh, I'll say no more on that. I attended the public safety building workshop, uh, the public outreach uh, meeting uh, yesterday at Pleasant Hill. Uh, I must say the chiefs, you'd be impressed by how well the chiefs do in presenting this. And it's, uh, it's a terrific proposal. Uh, people should get to know what's going on because the degree of uh, increased utilization of the facility and the deteriorating condi condition of what we have there absolutely justifies uh, this project uh, and the efficiencies that are being built into it. Um, uh, to do, uh, oh, uh, longtime Higgins Beach resident uh, Anna Peets. Uh, best wishes to her on her 100th birthday this uh. Sunday. Uh, oh and as God. sweet a lady as you'll ever meet. And that's it. I'm sorry. Um, I apologize to the council, but um, I don't know if you all remember. I think it was presented to the whole council. It may have just been ordinance, but um, we had a woman come forward that was complaining about um, a scent. It was a scent issue. Um, and was it just ordinance? Or did she make a statement to the whole council? Yeah, it was. It was an email, but she did also come to a, a meeting. And um, Councillor Foley and I were driving to um, uh, council tonight, and 
she had made a complaint about um, the smell of marijuana, very strong smell of marijuana, and this is harvesting time. <laughs> didn't realize that, but I learned something new every day. And um, when she came in, you know, she was pretty upset, and, you know, you hear it, but we drove down tonight, um, and I would say a mile and a half to two miles. Is that an exaggeration? A little, a little bit. bit. A little bit. It felt like it. Um, but it stayed, it was pervasive. It was, yeah. It stayed, if you had, we had, we had the windows down like maybe like this much. It, the, the smell was um, o overwhelming. Hmm. And we were like passing through. So um, I can't imagine if, I mean, I, I'm not sure I'd want my kids even, I mean, obviously you, you can't. Well, I don't know. I don't know what happens when maybe that's why I feel so perky tonight. But um, you are awful talking. I know. Normally, I don't talk this much. Um, maybe we stayed on that road a little too long tonight. But um, uh, uh, maybe I do want to move to that street. Anyway, the point being, um, I, I guess my point, even more so than just validating what she was saying and how it's something that. This council really needs to be aware of when we're when, when we're talking about what we want to allow and not allow is that it's, it's how imperative it is for us to make sure that when we do get a complaint like that and it's before us that we do go and check stuff out and that we do go and 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 make sure that that we're really looking into things. I mean, this is a really large town, and I think that until you're um, running a campaign or um, working in this or working in the town or you're a real estate agent or any of those things that really get you out you don't realize that we're over 20,000 people and we cover a very large area um, and so it's very easy for us most most towns this size don't have this form of government and or they're or they're they're Counselors are broken off into regions or sections, divisions, wards. Um, but we cover everything. So it was just really struck me tonight about personally, I need to do a much better job of making sure that when I get a complaint like that, that I actually go and do the research behind it. Um, because we do get a lot of them, um, especially when you're on ordinance. We get a lot of like, you know, one or two things here. And it's really important that we really get out there. And, and I personally just want to make sure that I'm doing that more. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up. Thank you. Just a couple of items uh, to be quick. First is um, um, I think it's funny because actually I'm starting to focus more. So um, I'm actually celebrating a milestone uh, this week in a birthday, and I got my AARP card invitation. Uh -huh. So I hope that's not an indication of why I voted for the senior uh, project. <laughs> but uh, um, it's kind of interesting when you kind of things that hit you in life and you're like, wow. I so, got one and I'm younger than you, so don't worry about it. I know, I know. Um, the second piece of that, I um, wanted to mention about a comment that was, ma a comment that was made earlier tonight um, in public comments. And I'm going to be specific, even though we t typically do not mention names, I'm going to be specific to the name because he's also a claimant in the lawsuit against the town. So I think it's appropriate to bring this up because I think the public needs to be aware of the lawsuit. So Mr. Doyle, Michael Doyle, who is from Falmouth, continues to come to our council and makes comments. And I really want to thank the citizens for being tolerant because I see the eyes that roll when he speaks. I hear comments. I, I, I get feedback from citizens who watch at home, and they wonder why we let that happen or at least why he's allowed to make the comments. And I, two things um, to kind of understand. One is I find that by not responding, which is not necessarily not listening, um, it simply makes it a lot easier because it doesn't fuel the process or fuel the situation. So while I know our council's rules say that we're not supposed to be personal, I simply allow him to go to a particular point so that we can just move on as a community because the fact is, is that his comments are not important to this community. But unfortunately, we have to allow that his opportunity for free speech. The reason why I'm mentioning him by name is because we do have pending lawsuits in which one was recently settled that the citizens should know about because he did mention this previously. Um, I think it's ironic that he doesn't mention that it was settled. But the um, actual settlement was that the judge actually ruled in favor of Scarborough um, um, in which we did not have to release the emails in which he continuously references. And not only did she rule in favor of us, 
She also fined him in a little excess of about $1,500. And my understanding wrote a personal note, and keep in mind is that most judges have clerks that write very formal documents, wrote a personal note, and the reason for the fine was for the frivolous lawsuits that he continues to file against the town. So I, I hope that you know um, that at least one of those, there are a, a couple more pending, but um, I think that um, the citizens need to understand why we kind of tolerate and, and are uh, thicker skinned in, in allowing this to happen, but they should have, they should also know that at least one of those cases has been resolved in our favor as we expected. Um, and with that, I'm going to leave the other item that I was going to bring up because I don't want to be the longest person to talk. Um, so uh, with that, I'll take a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Thank you. Have a good night. Nice. Classic. You realize that because of